Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our, our second meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, the meeting is obviously now open to the public. Um, for those who are in the public gallery, um, you're welcome to use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and all devices are muted. Um, you can connect to Assembly Wi-Fi. The password details are available on the gallery rules, and it is not permitted to take photographs or record any of the meeting. Um, so we have received po apologies this morning then from Stuart Dixon and from Gary Middleton. Um, Claire, something's just going to be a little bit late. Yeah, and we're expecting Claire in a little while. Um, so if we move on then to the second item on the agenda, um, that is the, the draft minutes. Um, if you ref look at point 2.1 of the draft minutes um, on page 4 of the pack, our members contend that the minutes are an accurate reflection of the meeting. Yes, great, yeah. great. Thank you. Um, so, so moving on to item three, then chairperson's business. Um, three point one on your agenda. Um, there's an invitation for the assembly business trust event, uh, which is Monday the tenth of February at one p.m. in the Long Gallery, and that's on page three of your table papers. Um, they have asked me to address the event as chair of the committee and any member who wishes to attend should RSVP and the contact details are on page three then. Or members, if you let us know, we'll, we'll let them know. Um, so we're also aware that the first meeting of the Ministerial Forum for Trade took place on the 23rd of January, chaired by the Minister at the, um, of State at the Department for International Trade and attended by the Economy Minister. The forum was established under the processes for making free trade agreements after the United Kingdom has left the European Union with the intention that it will be a flexible mechanism to enable ministerial discussion at the key points during trade negotiations. Um, the Minister will update the committee on the forum when she attends committee next week. So um, we are going to move on then to, to item four, which is um, our departmental briefing. Um, at last week's meeting, the committee heard from the three heads of group within the department, um, Energy, EU, Exit and Management Services, and this week we will hear from Head of Economic Policy and Head of Skills and Education. Um, if you see the clerk's memo on page 18, it provides a departmental overview, and then the clerk's memo on page 20 of your pack on the New Decade, New Approach document. The department's first day brief for the committee is at page 28 of your pack, and it sets out the background information on the remit structure and functions of the department and identifies key issues um, that the department is now facing. The departmental business plan is in um, page 53 and the mid-year progress report at then is at page 90. So I'd like to welcome to the meeting this morning um, Heather Cousins, Head of Skills and Education Group and Dermot McLean, Head of Economic Policy Division. So um, if you would like to... Give us a bit of an overview of each of the. Okay. You want me to uh, yep, begin, please. Chair? Mm -hmm. so, good morning and thank you for the invitation for coming along. Um, perhaps I'll just outline the role uh, within the Department of the Economic uh, Strategy Group. As I've been acting head of the, the group since uh, October 2019, there are three divisions within the group Strategic Policy Division, Tourism, Telecoms, Mineral and Petroleum Licensing Division, and Business Engagement Division. The Strategic Policy Division uh, provides analysis and advice on the development of evidence-based economic policy, identifies the overall strategic direction for economic growth for the department. As well as developing the local economic policy, the division provides a link through to the national economic policy development and implementation at a national level. Key areas of work for this division include the coordination and the development of the uh, current or the last draft industrial strategy. It also works on the alignment with the Programme for Government on Economic Outcomes, uh, strengthening productivity uh, policy, management of the um, or development of a circular uh, economy framework. Uh, we've also been feeding into, from the Department's perspective, the work that we've been doing on looking at the Shared Prosperity Fund at a national level to replace uh, structural funds. On the innovation side, we look at innovation policy in the Northern Ireland context. We also uh, are looking to develop a regional action plan for Northern Ireland to contribute to the delivery of the national target of 2.4% of GDP spend on R&D by 2027, which is a national target in the National Industrial Strategy. 
Uh, we also have responsibility for oversight of the Matrix Science and Technology Panel. <coughs> and we also have carried out some sectoral studies, including on cyber security and artificial intelligence. More recently, the department, uh, under the city deals arrangement, the, the vast majority of the additional money that will come to Northern Ireland will be for innovation, telecoms and digital projects which is the policy responsibility of this department and therefore we have been tasked with looking at putting in place arrangements for overseeing and management of the, those aspects of the city deals that would flow through the department and we've also been engaging with the external uh, partners and players in the city deals, uh, the Belfast city deal and the other regions to help them with their initial work around those innovation and digital projects. Turning to the Tourism, Telecoms and Minerals and Petroleum Division, the tourism team has responsibility for tourism policy and legislation, responsibility for the development and overall uh, tourism strategy. It also undertakes the sponsorship role for Tourism NI, which is an ALB of the department. Um, we also have a role in the sponsorship of Tourism Ireland, which is um, a north-south body, although it is also a private ROI company limited by <coughs> R&T, which is a slight... Uh, complication. In relation to telecoms, um, telecoms policy is obviously a reserved matter and the responsibility of the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, although we do work with them in relation to the aspects of their work in Northern Ireland. We act as local body in delivering some of the initiatives in Northern Ireland on behalf of DCMS in liaison with Building Digital UK, which is a, a, a body under DCMS. These initiatives include both fixed and mobile telecoms infrastructure projects, such as the first two broadband programmes, um, NI Broadband Improvement Programme and the Superfast Rollout Programme. Other policy initiatives are delivered on a UK-wide basis by BDUK in collaboration with some other uh, local bodies, for example, the, the councils in relation to the full fibre network. Um, I understand last week you heard from my colleague Colin Lewis, who is the SRO for the Project Stratum. Uh, I will be taking over that responsibility in the coming weeks as it moves back into the telecoms uh, division. In relation to minerals and petroleum licensing, the department is the licensing authority for exploration and extraction of minerals and petroleum. However, uh, the Crown Estate is the licensing authority for the exploration and extraction of precious minerals such as gold and silver. We also have, the division also has, holds the sponsorship role for the Geological Survey uh, NI. Staff and GSNI are seconded from the British Geological Surver Survey and they provide expert advice and decision makers in a range of departments including DF, our own department, uh, Department for Infrastructure and uh, DERA. I should also highlight that uh, this group, while part of this uh, division at the moment, will be moving in the coming weeks to the Energy Division. The other division in the group is the Business Engagement Division. This division undertakes the sponsorship role for uh, Invest Northern Ireland, Intertrade Ireland and Northern Ireland Screen. It also has a role in monitoring of the NI Business Startup Programme with local councils and has recently taken on work on entrepreneurship although this is, uh, work is still at a very early stage. The sector initiatives team within the division has also responsible for work on a number of sectors, air access, access to finance and agri-food. So you can see the group has quite a, a broad range of areas which it covers and I'd be hopefully happy to answer any questions that you may have in relation to that remit. I don't know if you want to deal with that now or hear from Heather and then. So maybe we hear from Heather first of all, and then we'll take questions from members afterwards. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, the Skills and Education Group uh, is comprised of six divisions, uh, four divisions that are involved with policy and provision of skills and training, and two uh, teams that deal with cross-cutting group issues. The group as a whole spends three quarters of the department's budget uh, and a lot of that is dispersed through arm's length bodies rather than directly by ourselves. If I start off with the higher education division, that division is responsible for funding and policy oversight of three universities and two university colleges. 
So the division would have regular meetings with all of those bodies uh, and also in, attends employers' forums to ensure that there's connection with uh, the business interests. There are a number of particularly meaty issues that we're dealing with at the moment, and one of those is Ulster University and the Greater Belfast Development, which I'm sure people are aware of through the NIAO report on major capital projects. Uh, we are also uh, producing advice on sustainable funding models for universities, and again, that has also attracted a lot of attention. Uh, there is no doubt that our universities have fallen behind their counterparts elsewhere in Great Britain because of um, tuition fees and then the public funding that goes into it, not matching the uh, English uh, funding model. So that needs to be looked at and discussed in the future. We are also keen to do a review of tuition fees for postgraduate loans because over the last three years that was quite a lot of the correspondence that we received. And again, it was something we could not change while we did not have an executive and yourselves back in business. So it's great now to have the opportunity to bring those things forward. And we are about to embark on a review of higher education in further education. But broader than that, looking at the whole level four or five provision, which the skills barometer shows is undersupplied. Uh, and we, what we want in that space is collaboration between bodies rather than competition, which we're beginning to see at the moment. So that review will hopefully get underway in the next couple of months. On the further education side, um, as you know, the, the six regional colleges are non-departmental public bodies, so they are subject to scrutiny quite intensely from the department. Um, we scrutinise performance and we scrutinise their, their funding. Their budgets are under extreme pressure because over the last <coughs> rounds of budget cuts, they have not been protected on, on like schools. And the difficulty is that about 88% of um, spend for their education colleges is on salaries. So that's a particular difficulty when you don't have uh, increases for, for paying prices. That impacts on attracting talent to the further education colleges. Uh, and also, they suffer from outdated terms and conditions of employment, which inhibit flexibility and agility. So that's another project that, that we're looking at. I think also for further education colleges, there is an issue with images, where you know, it's sometimes seen as a place you go when you fail to get into sixth form and so on. And yet, further education colleges are doing absolutely amazing work with, with young people. So we want to uh, have another look at that. There's pressure also because they have a dual mandate. So on the one hand, there's qualifications, business development, and so on. But also they are tasked with uh, quite a lot of work to be done on social inclusion. And again, there can be tensions between those two mandates. We have recently been involved um, in a <coughs> UK-wide look at the College of the Future. So there is an independent commission looking at what the role should be of the College of the Future. And they indeed were over in Belfast last week uh, going through their draft recommendations and we fed into that process. We have recently had a number of accountability meetings with the further education colleges. There are three report cards that we look at. One is on qualifications and their achievement there is quite outstanding. Um, another one is on business and employer engagement. Uh, and the work they do on Innovate Us, Skills Focus and Assured Skills Academies, again, is, is impressive. And then on the dual mandate and social inclusion, again, they have achieved all of their targets, so it is a, a good picture. If I turn to apprenticeships, careers and vocational education, this division is, was tasked with delivering the reforms to apprenticeships and youth training that were agreed under the previous mandate. Great successes include um, higher level apprenticeships, where um, there is a lot of work going on at levels four and five and indeed beyond. And we have a, a, approximately a thousand people on higher level apprenticeship programs. And on the apprenticeships NI, which are levels two and three, we have about 9,000 young people on those programs. 
One of the issues there is that uh, APPS NI, as it's known, is partly funded by the European Social Fund, so there will be an issue in the future about the placement funding. It's about 40% of the funding for those programmes. Um, in addition to that, the uh, division has developed a new traineeship programme, which will combine uh, the full-time further education offering at level two and the training for success offering at level two into a traineeship programme that will give every young person going through that the equivalent of five GCSEs. So it is quite an exciting development. We are in the middle also of developing a new level not to one programme, which has been co-designed with young people, with providers, uh, and incorporates a lot of new elements such as mentoring uh, and other support. And, and that programme, we would, because it's not quite ready, then we're going to extend um, current level not to one provision in an interim basis until we have the new programme ready to roll out. We're also keen to include flexibility into that programme so that potentially providers there could do some elements and provide some level two qualifications to enable the young person to either go into employment or into the traineeship. Um, that division also includes careers and um, the current career strategy will be coming to an end so we will be developing a new career strategy looking at what is the best way in the modern world to provide careers advice uh, across the piece. The division also is involved in providing the Peace for Youth programme, and again that programme has met its targets for participation and for outcomes. Um, obviously with, with apprenticeships, there was the apprenticeship levy that caused quite a bit of um, controversy. Um, and We do not have the digital learning account that they have in England, and there's no uh, plan to roll that out. However, um, the best way for employers in Northern Ireland to make use of any levy monies that they have paid is to employ apprenticeships and we provide the off-the-job training free. So that's how they get value back from any apprenticeship levy. Where it doesn't apply is to public sector bodies and also to all age apprenticeships. And those are again two policy developments that we want to bring forward in this new mandate. Um, on the skills strategy side, there has been a lot of exciting work going on on developing a new skills strategy because, again, that strategy comes to an end in 2020. So we have three main pieces of research helping us with developing that strategy. One is the skills barometer work, which has just been refreshed, and that shows us where our oversupply and undersupply of skills are. Another one is a piece of work that was done um, by... Dr Skilling, looking at skills and innovation and recommending how we could integrate skills and innovation policy to improve productivity uh, and to place Northern Ireland higher in the global stage. And the third piece of work that is ongoing is the work we're doing with OECD on developing skills priorities for Northern Ireland. That piece of work has been a very extensive piece involving all stakeholders and including uh, political parties. Um, so it, it has been extremely valuable. Uh, we're at the stage now where last week OECD were over giving their draft recommendations and stakeholders had the opportunity to critique those recommendations. Uh, and it was a very, very useful series of events. The events took place in Belfast, in Derry, Londonderry, and in Dungannon, and were really well attended and were very vibrant events. So uh, the team was very pleased with how that went. Basically, uh, we're looking at four, um, five main, main um, objectives or priorities, rather, for that. First one is creating a culture of lifelong learning, uh, where at the moment only 10% of our adult population engage in any form of learning and with the new world of work technology etc people are going to have to upskill and reskill at various points in their career we want to look at using skills um, effectively in terms of reducing skills imbalances and trying to assure that there is a pipeline of, of skills coming forward um, using skills more effectively in the workplace by deploying more modern workplace practices, such as flexible working uh, and, and so on. 
digital skills, major issue in Northern Ireland, ensuring that we have that pipeline, and that digital skills goes right from primary school through to uh, post-primary and beyond. Um, so it's not just cyber security and so on, but it's the whole range of digital skills and being digital natives. And the final one then is strengthening the governance and skill systems, which is about trying to reduce uh, bureaucracy, st uh, making sure that the skill system is focused on the learner, not the institution. That's really our, our ambition for that one. That division also um, negotiates and provides the Assured Skills Academies that I'm sure you're all aware of, and, and that has been very successful. Our difficulty at the moment with Assured Skills Academies is declining numbers of applicants because we are uh, you know, nearing levels of full employment, apart from our economically inactive levels. So it's becoming more difficult to find a pool of unemployed graduates. And therefore, we need to look at can we flex the model so that people could still be at work and join an academy because sometimes people are underemployed but they don't want to leave a job where there is a risk of maybe not getting a job. You know, there are about 85% of people at least do get employment after an academy but it's still a risk for young people. So that's something else that we're, we're looking at. Um, that particular division also looks at economic social inclusion and has responsibility for policy for people who are neat, that is not in employment, education or training. The other two uh, branches that I mentioned, mentioned were the quality improvement team and they work right across the entire group uh, and they help the institutions with their quality improvement plans where inspections have shown that improvements are required and they also work for the Department for Communities uh, Steps to Success looking at the quality from their providers. Um, then the Strategy Portfolio Management Group, uh, it's a cross-cutting team that look at issues that are both intra- and interdepartmental. To give you some examples, um, they are a coordinating function for the 14 to 19 strategy that we're working with jointly with education. They are also coordinating the review of higher education and further education. They would deal with the education and skills impacts of city deals, and they are progressing the CBI city or digital skills um, action plan. So anything that goes across all of the different aspects of the group is coordinated by the strategy portfolio management team. So that's the skills and education group. Thank you very much for both of you for your your briefings and their. Um, two huge areas and two very important areas. Um, I'd just like to pick up on um, a couple of questions before I open it up to the to the members. Um, in relation to the R and D spend, you mentioned that we are trying to hit a target of two point four by twenty twenty seven. That's the national target, chair. Uh, and what is our current spend on R and D? Current spend would be about one point nine percent. Thank you. And. What kind of level of investment will be required to bring it um, up to? I don't have an actual figure for that, but it would be uh, an extremely large figure. I think it is even recognised at a national level that it is quite a stretched target to try to achieve 2.4% mm -hmm. of GDP as investing in R&D at a national level uh, <coughs> through the programmes that they run. They are investing billions of pounds over the coming years in both UKRI, Innovate UK and a number of other programmes that we would tap into or mm -hmm. try to get our uh, universities and our companies to avail of. But even at that level of investment, there is still doubt as to the achievability of 2.4% by 2027. Mm. Could, could I add something to that? That um, one of the problems for us is that sometimes when there is that extra investment, there are Barnet consequentials that come to Northern Ireland but do not go into research and development. Okay, thank you. Um, and just in relation to the economic strategy and um, where we are at with reviewing that in terms of the. Um, the new decade, new approach, um, and in terms also of you know leaving the European Union at the end of the, the week, um, commitments, for example, around the Green New Deal that were included in, in the new decade, new approach, how has that been incorporated into the, the new economic strategy? I think, Chair, we recognise that we now need to totally uh, take a fundamental look at the, what was the draft industrial strategy that was produced three years ago. 
and the landscape has changed and will change and is continuing to change. And particularly, it is difficult to uh, draft an economic strategy until we have some clarity around what the arrangements will be for Northern Ireland uh, in relation particularly to unfettered access to uh, GB, the rest of the GB market, and what other conditions Northern Ireland will have to uh, uh, comply with. So we are working with the, the team in the department who are dealing with EUX issues, uh, and that will then feed into what would be uh, a pros possibly a rewrite of economic strategy. That said, the, the five foundations that are in the current strategy are likely to still feature as the areas where we would still be looking to focus around enhanced education skills and employability, accelerating innovation and research, driving inclusive sustainable growth, succeeding in global markets and building the best economic infrastructure. Those are pretty much you know, the areas, I suppose, underneath it, it will be nuanced around what would we need to do to help businesses in relation to the new um, arrangements that we will have to face in the future around uh, exporting and trade. And just finally then for myself, um, Heather, you mentioned the apprenticeship levy. Um, and in 2016, the, the finance minister and the economy minister outlined basically that there was no increase to the executive's budget in terms of the apprenticeship levy. Is, is that still the case? Um, it's, well, in, in terms of, of the budget, it's still uh, the case that there are no levy monies going into it. But there was, a, a, there was an increase for the higher, to fund the higher level apprenticeships. So, you know, there's still a considerable amount of money being spent on apprenticeships. As I say, for employers, what they have to do is employ apprentices and avail of the training for those apprentices. Yeah, because it's something that is mentioned quite a lot by, by business and they, they, they feel a frustration that the, the apprenticeship levy isn't being utilised as well or that they aren't seeing the benefit of the apprenticeship levy. What I would say on that one is that the apprenticeship levy, the idea was to increase the number of apprentices and that hasn't actually happened uh, in, in, in England. And so when individual firms of complained about not getting the value, we've been able to demonstrate to them actually what they are getting in terms of the value of training for their apprentices. Uh, and we hope to be able to do that for every employer taking on apprentices to show the value that they are actually getting, because it gets lost a bit because their apprentices are availing of that training and they haven't got sight of what that value is. Okay. John? Uh, thank you. Just following on to that point, um, if I heard you correctly, you're, you're saying that the apprenticeship levy hasn't increased the number of apprenticeships in England? It hasn't. So the question then is, has it increased the number of apprenticeships here? The levy hasn't increased the number of apprenticeships <coughs> here because the people can't avail of it. Um, there are some increases in apprentices on the higher apprenticeship levy, or level, sorry, whereas at level two, level three, they remain similar to previous levels. Well, but companies here are paying the levy, is that not correct? Or are the companies, public sectors paying yes, the levy? And, and the public sector is not able to avail of, of that training. That's one of the things we want to change. The original strategy envisaged that it was people up to the age of 25 and no public sector apprenticeships. Those are two policy changes we would like to introduce. OK, thank you. Just, but, uh, obviously, both of you have a very wide-ranging um, briefs under your management, and we'll not get through it all today. Um, we could spend time in each of those sections around questioning. But I have a number of questions just in relation to a number of varied areas. The, the conditions which have been placed around uh, the Oxford University capital, um, the, the terminology is, is quite definitive around. Because you've put uh, stringent, tr stringent conditions, that's not the words of the tank, but stringent conditions around that. Why, first of all? Um, and in terms of the funding that's being used, the financial tra transaction capital, which uh, I was always viewed that was very complicated, and perhaps this is why the conditions are in place, it's very complicated and difficult to spend. Are you confident that they'll be able to go to invest that money? Um, yes, the, the, the conditions are described as stringent, probably by um, university in particular. But it has been necessary to put those conditions in place because this is still public money, albeit it's financial transactions capital. 
Uh, and the reason that the amount is what it is is because the university got into difficulty with this particular project and we need to have assurance that they are going to be able to manage it in the future and that we won't see further significant cost increases. <coughs> and as part of um, the business case that was put forward, there was a very comprehensive report produced that showed the vulnerability of Ulster University's finances in general, and that is why we have to assure ourselves that this is going to be managed appropriately in the future. Financial transactions capital is, if you like, it's a loan, which then has to be repaid. It's not particularly complicated, but why it has been given back so far is because the spend is just not there for for it to be able to be <coughs> utilised. So it's not it, it's pushed into the future as opposed to it won't be spent. And, and why did the university get into difficulties over this project? Do you know? I know you're not the university, obviously, but do you have a view on that? There, there are a number of reasons, and they were all detailed in in the report that we commissioned from Deloitte's. Some of it was to do with procurement issues at the beginning of the project, where there was a separate contract for the basement works and a separate contract for the work on top. Uh, and, and that caused some difficulties uh, and disputes, delays, legal costs, etc. Uh, and th that was part of the reason. And then because of those delays, construction inflation meant that the, the cost uh, is significantly more than envisaged at the outset. And, uh, and this, uh, is it the responsibility of the university to commission the project? Uh, was there any role for the department in that? Um, it was the responsibility of the university. The, the department approved the original business case uh, and the department requested information and so on on progress. But it's the university's project and it's for the university to manage that project. Okay. Okay. I, I, I'm conscious there's other people. I'm, I'm, I'll maybe come back to that later. Here. Just one more question in relation to tourism, if that's OK. Uh, in relation to the tourism strategy, I have been engaging with uh, people uh, and businesses who operate around Loch Ness, and they're concerned that Loch Ness is almost forgot about, if not forgot about in terms of the approach from both Tourism Ireland and Tourism ANA in promoting the huge tourism potential that Loch Ness offers, and obviously the economic benefits that would bring. Um, what would be your views on their assertions? Um, I wouldn't have the detail on that, mm. uh, Mr. Guide, uh, but certainly we are in the. There had been the previous tourism strategy, the draft strategy that had been worked towards in the in the previous man mandate was to cover the period up to 2025. Over the last number of years, we have been working with the various stakeholders to look to update that and prepare, prepare a new draft for the incoming minister to consider. Uh, in, and the intention is to produce a new draft tourism strategy that would cover up to 2030. Uh, and the, the intention would be that when the Minister has time to have a look at that, that that would go out for consultation uh, later this year. And obviously that would be an opportunity for stakeholders to feed in if they believe that that strategy itself does not uh, provide sufficient input in, in different areas. And we would obviously take on board that feedback. OK, so you'll have to get a bit lucky. <laughs> Thank you. Sinead. Oh, yeah. Um, can I just ask a wee bit about uh, your current um, position around uh, City Deals? You mentioned it, that you were working with Belfast and, and obviously Derry City. Yeah. Um, City Deals, can, at what stage are those plans? Well, and obviously, um, you, you will be aware that the Belfast Regional City Deal uh, the heads of terms was signed in March mm -hmm. of uh, 2019, and it's uh, for a total of £850 million. £350 million of that will come from UK uh, to cover innovation and digital projects. Uh, the executive, if it agrees to sign off on the deal, will provide £350 million, with the council and their partners providing a further £150 million. We've, uh, within the department, for the economy because we deal with innovation, uh, digital or telecoms and tourism. We have been working with the, the Belfast Regional uh, Deal partners in relation to those projects that they are seeking to work up at the moment in relation to innovation. We have also been working with them through Tourism NI on the tourism potential projects that would come in as part of the executive match funding. To uh, get those to a stage, they are currently at a stage where they are looking to produce outline business cases. 
that they, uh, particularly in the innovation space, they are looking to bring those to the department for consideration at some stage in the coming months. The tourism projects, I think, are slightly further behind in relation that they may be later in the year. <coughs> in relation to the uh, Derry London Derry Straban City deal, as you are aware, no heads of terms have yet been signed, but we have been working with the council in looking at the structure of that proposal. Um, our understanding is that um, 50 million of that deal will come from uh, the UK again for innovation and digital projects. Uh, potentially with the executive providing match funding, uh, but as yet we have no details on the council contribution. The other two deals are uh, the regional deals are still at a very early stage. The Mid South West, which covers Oma, Fermanagh, Mid Ulster, and ABC, uh, deal is still in development. We have had some initial meetings with them around the scope of what they would intend or would like to put into such a deal. Um, the indicative figure from UK government at the moment is somewhere around £135 million, but we still believe that that is quite some way off uh, getting to a heads of terms been signed. And the final deal is Causeway Coast and Glens, uh, with a potential for UK government funding of around £35 million. But again, they are still at the very early stages of that deal. We've had some initial meetings, but uh, there hasn't been a great deal of progress from our perspective. Uh, we are not leading on city deals. The Department of Finance leads on city deals. We are only dealing with the aspects that would fall to innovation uh, and digital and potentially tourism. Okay. Um, in relation to the R&D, and I know uh, Kiva has already asked you about our percentage of spend in it, um, and I'm very aware that if we don't spend more in R&D, you know, we're going to end up with the same problems that we have in our economy, very low productivity and that. Have, have you got any innovative ways of actually looking at increasing that spend for R&D um, within the context of, of this mandate? Um, well, certainly we are aware that if you look at the expenditure figures on R&D for business expenditure in R&D, mm -hmm. over the last year in particular, we were comparable with other regions in the UK. The one area where we spend uh, a lot less is on government expenditure in R&D, yeah, yeah. and that's partly to do with budgets, but also you have to realise that some of the programmes that are run out of the UK are national programmes. So we ha Innovate UK have a presence in Northern Ireland located in Invest NI, so we would work closely with them. Some of those very large programmes like Strength in Places <laughs> uh, and uh, Sector Deals we would be trying to encourage and support companies in Northern Ireland to participate in those programmes. They are quite an onerous um, process to get through. And the other issue is the structure of the economy in Northern Ireland doesn't lend itself to some of those uh, programmes because of the scale that they're involved in. But I had a meeting yesterday with the new head of Innovate UK um, and around how we could work better with them to get more participation and a higher success rate. Uh, from Northern Ireland in those national programmes at the moment, our participation rate is lower than uh, than would you expect on a per capita, and our success rate has been lower than we would have anticipated as well. Uh, so th that is one area. Obviously, um, another area is in relation to the fact that um, under structural funds, we had significant funding coming in through the Department to Invest Northern Ireland for investing in uh, business expenditure in R&D. Uh, with that coming to an end, we have been trying to get some clarity around what the follow-on programme will be, the, the Shared Prosperity Fund, uh, and we need to understand what that will cover uh, in relation <coughs> to R&D and innovation space. We have worked with Invest NI and developed a new innovation accreditation scheme, which has been launched uh, I think it was September, October last year, as a way of trying to encourage more companies to get involved uh, and get involved in innovation and early stage development in uh, Northern Ireland. And just, uh, I suppose, uh, an observation that I would like to make um, to, to Heather. Uh, I think you know we've got an opportunity now. Uh, with the new strategies coming forward, the new skill strategies coming forward to do things different um, here because if we keep on repeating the same and even with our economic strategy or industrial st strategy, we've got to actually not repeat 
the, the problems of the past and, and the mistakes of the past that we have made. And we have to make sure that we find ways of investing in skills, investing in our universities, and investing in that R and D. And you know, I think the government spending it. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Out of the 12 regions of the UK, we have the lowest yes. expenditure in R and D, and we have the lowest productivity. And that's not a coincidence. So we, we have something fundamentally to change. We can't just take strategies and just revamp them and change a few words and change a few dates. We actually have to change the fundamental way we do things uh, in Northern Ireland in order to have better outcomes and better skill outcomes. And I'm quite interested in that 14 to 19 year old strategy as well because we're losing a lot of young people and that is having a knock-on effect as we go forward in, uh, in the economy. So I, I'd be interested in knowing that oh, as well. Pick up. Mm -hmm. Certainly in relation to um, productivity, we're well aware of the productivity challenge in Northern Ireland. We have the lowest productivity of any uh, region in the UK, which in itself lags behind its major competitors on a European and a world stage. Innovation R&D is one component. There, there's lots of aspects of the, or the productivity puzzle. We have been doing some uh, background research work with uh, the Productivity Innovation Network to look at that issue within Northern Ireland and what can be done to, to look at how do we improve productivity going forward. Uh, we are also uh, starting a piece of work between ourselves as policy makers and Invest NI as the delivery agent to see what else we may, that we could do to, to address or to help productivity in Northern Ireland. You are right in relation to we lose too many people um, at an early stage out of doing science, technology, engineering and maths and STEM, and in particular uh, women in STEM, and under the Matrix panel we produced a women in STEM report last year on how we can do more to encourage uh, female students to continue a career in science, technology, engineering. And that's where there's a, a massive drop off in the number of females at the age of 16 who then do not progress on to take up careers in, the, in those uh, subject areas, which will be the core area that will be required if we are to drive up our productivity going forward. Um, David Skilling also did a piece of work for us in relation to our previous industrial strategy, and he did highlight that what we had said in the industrial strategy covered the right areas, but we have to realise as a region we cannot be expert and, and world-beating in every area. Therefore, we need to decide and focus on the areas where we do believe that we do have strengths and trying to build on those areas rather than trying to support all areas, and that is probably a, a, quite a large challenge for us in Northern Ireland. I don't know if Heather wants to add anything about the skills mm -hmm. side. Um, I suppose on the skills side, you know, and R and D specifically with universities, uh, they traditionally have not done well in competitive funding bids with the uh, research councils. So we are encouraging them to try to do more, and we're working with uh, UKRI more closely, and also basically encouraging them to do everything they can. Also having discussions on the. Uh, US Ireland um, funding and Science Foundation Ireland as well to see if there is more that we can do there. So we're, we're exploring all of the various avenues for R&D um, and on the skills side I think the new skills strategy will be different. There is more of a focus on the lifelong learning and reskilling and upskilling <coughs> rather than um, you know obsessing on qualifications. It is about skills and competences. Um, it is also on terms of the career side and attractiveness. We need to work with employers so that the the right information is out there for young people about what these careers are, uh, and you know more use of case studies on how people can progress and what a fantastic career it can be in this particular field. We we haven't you know got a lot of that, and it has to be a partnership approach with the employers. Um, you know if they want people, they need to also do outreach to make sure that people know about what's what's available. David, I would just probably challenge um, how I don't I don't believe Invest NI are an innovative platform for driving um, R and D, and and that's just basically because it's not that body, it's not that type of department, as far as my understanding and knowledge of it is. Is there another method or methodology within your department and strategies that you'd be looking at? Really, um, I suppose. Uh, pumping and fast-tracking, uh, working uh, at that 
innovative front for in order to promote R&D within businesses, maybe more than within uh, uh, an arm's length body to be a leader for it. I hope well, you understand what I mean. <laughs> from a department perspective, all our funding is channelled on economic development spend for, in, uh, for businesses is through Invest Northern Ireland. So we would work closely with them. There's certainly uh, about a third of their budget goes towards uh, uh, providing funding support for innovation and R&D type programmes that support industry driven mm -hmm. innovation in R&D. Yeah. And that would be the, probably the largest supporting programme that would be in Northern Ireland. There's obviously other work goes on in relation to entrepreneurship and innovation within the councils that we would seek to, to, to support and work with in relation to how do we get more start-ups, because yeah. we have the lowest start-up rate in the UK. Uh, we do have a, a quite, a, and actually the highest failure rate, I think, for uh, in, the, in the first year. Those companies that do get through the first year, we actually have quite a good success rate in driving those up to a million, uh, from you know a turnover of a million. But then, again, we stall at that level in relation to the percentage of companies that then scale up from a million to 10 million is probably the lowest in the UK. And that is another area where we need to look at how do we one, get more companies to start up innovative technology-based companies. How do we ensure that we can get them through that uh, first year, which is um, uh, where the failure rate is high? But equally, how do we get those companies who then are successful grow to a million? How do we get them scale up from being local companies to being national and international companies? And, and that is something where we have done a piece of work on looking at scaling for high growth companies. Sorry, Chair, do you mind if I ask one more quick question or just uh, an observation on that as well? There's about 1,700 clients of Invest NA and we have about 79,000 businesses. So there is a major piece of work that has to be done in order for us to support the other businesses. And that's all, you know, I want to kind of yeah. say about that. Chair, I, I believe you are coming in front of the committee and they may be in a better place to answer some of the questions around broadening the right. base of their okay. uh, company base. Okay. Just in relation to the, the drawdown of research funding, um, obviously it's not just our universities that have barriers to accessing the, the British Research Council funding, like some of the universities in, in England would face barriers to it, would be the London kind of universities, that group that tend to do well. Um, and you mentioned the, the department um, working with universities to, to support those type of applications, um, and like that's welcome. But what what actually is being done to to like ensure that the applications that are being put forward are, are more likely to be successful? Um, and also um, in terms of Horizon Europe, where are we in, with any clarity around our, our future access to, to that? Um. If I take that last one, I, I don't think that we are particularly clear. There were some proposals that came very recently from uh, Chris Skidmore on an alternative to, uh, but I am not fully familiar with okay. with those. In fact, Trevor Cooper m might know more about it than than I okay. do. In terms of um, how can we ensure that our universities are more successful. One of the things we have majored on is collaboration between the two universities because it was easier to be more successful <coughs> at scale than each in individual university going on their own. So any sort of strength in places we <coughs> have put in, we have tried to ensure that those are collaborative and that's working quite well in terms of the two universities working more closely together now than they ever did in the past. Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for your presentation. Just on the R&D funding, it's something I was, I was on the old Debbie Committee and the Economy Committee, so I do remember the uh, Horizon 2020 programme. I'm sure, Peter, you're very aware of it. So I think, to be fair, a lot of money was drawn down through that, through the universities uh, for R&D programmes and for large manufacturers like Bombardier and so on, uh, with the support of, of um, Invest. I think we are aware. So I think there, there needs to be a major bit of work to done to replace that funding to, and to bring in alternative sources. There's no doubt, and, and the points have been well made, you know, we need to keep the focus on R&D and, and on innovation, I suppose, is a more trendy term nowadays, but um, it is what, uh, how we're going to move business fo forward and how we're going to come forward with new ideas and, and trying to 
to uh, develop the economy locally. And we have so many people here that over the years have, have brought forward ideas and have the potential is there, and I think it's more and more we should support it. But I do, um, I think, worry and concern somewhat about how that money is going to be found in the future for, for major projects and for our universities for R&D type work. A um, couple of other issues. Um, the tourism policy, we've had um, in recent years some great success with uh, major events. Event tourism, I think, is something we should still focus on. I hope that will be the case. We only have to think about the, mm -hmm. the Open Golf Championship and the success of that. And I don't know how the department has what evaluation they've done on it. I think we'd be interested to know how that has been assessed. But I do know there are other ideas in the pipeline, like the World Rally Championship. I've had that before here, and I'm aware of a bid that has been worked up for that. And I would like to think we will be able to support events like that by bringing this. It's about selling us as a, as a place of success and a place where, where there is a very positive uh, future. And I think we all want to build on that. This place is now back and running, and I want to try and bring that forward. And I think through tourism and through event tourism, I think is a great way to, to promote that. So it, I'd like <coughs> to think there will be um, a focus on that within, within the strategy and that there will be a commitment towards it. Um, on the telecoms, too, I think would, something more on the um, 5G rollout, how that's going to develop. It's maybe not fully your programme or within your remit, but um, it is something that people are interested in. It's, again, um, we need fast systems to work and technology to develop if we're going to move forward. Um, well, a few other points on the universities. Maybe I'll come back to them, Chair, if that's OK. Yeah, okay. um, certainly, Heather can cover the <coughs> university R&D funding in Horizon 2020, which is more uh, fundamental research that would be undertaken by the, um, the universities. However, in relation to that, uh, you know, a structure was put in place during Horizon 2020, which helped with bid writing for those who were, who were bidding into that programme. Uh, in relation to the replacement funding, we certainly have been trying to get clarification from MHCLG, who are leading on the Shared Prosperity Fund as yet. Um, and we, you know, Scotland, Wales, and ourselves have been lobbying to try to get clarification as to what that will cover and how it will be dispersed. And we have certainly made the case that um, that we would be seeking replacement funding for what had been ERDF funding yeah. uh, for Northern Ireland. Uh, but that will all have to be to work through. We do have a slight concern in relation to the timing of that, in relation to that the commitment under ERDF, I think the drawdown period is through to 2023, uh, the, the guarantee, the, the government guarantee is in place. Um, however, when you're writing business for R&D projects that are drawn down over two or three years, we would need to be writing business in 2021. Um, that wouldn't be covered under the old uh, ERDF programme, and, and we would need clarity as to what level of funding we would be getting it from a national level to be able to to write that business under that programme, or else it will have to come out of other core budgets. Uh, in relation to tourism NI, uh, certainly the tourism NI is not an events company, but it runs programmes that support international events that bring in um, international uh, tourists and, and additional spend into Northern Ireland, they would obviously be subject to individual projects or uh, business cases and the question of affordability would be addressed within those. Um, the Tourism NI itself would have to be bidding and has in the past bid for funding from the executive to cover those types of uh, events. It does not carry or have the cover within its budget to, to cover such events. The um, the Open itself was a major success uh, for Northern Ireland, and the, the Royal and Ancient did produce a report there earlier, or at the end of last year, that showed the economic benefit of that program, or that event for Northern Ireland. And we, uh, myself, together with the, the head of the civil service, had a meeting with the Royal and Ancient, and we are at the early stages of looking at when we might be looking at bringing that event back to Northern Ireland again in the future. But I am aware that there are other uh, events, such as the, the Irish Open, 
that is coming in this year. The, the, Royal, the, the rally is events that people would like to come forward and seek funding for, but again, that would be subject to affordability and being able to secure the funding for those types of events to be distributed through Tourism NI. Yeah, but the policy within your own department would tend to lean towards the event tourism. Obviously, it's been a success. You recognise that? Uh, yeah, uh, in relation to yes, but it is important that we sort of distinguish that those types of events are international events where it's, we're trying to bring in bound tourism. Yeah, yeah. And so they have to be linked to some sort of economic benefit no, for Northern that. Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Which they have done. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah. The telecoms bit. Uh, on telecoms, I don't know if you want to cover Project Stratum. That was covered, but in relation to, I don't know if you want me to say something about mobile. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the mobile front, um, it is obviously a reserved matter. Um, it has been taken forward by the uh, DCMS. The, the mobile industry is regulated by Ofcom. The four main mobile networks, MO, the MNOs, the, the mobile network operators, provide the service in Northern Ireland. At the moment, there is a proposal out there for um, the shared, a shared rural network project being led by DCMS, which aims to improve mobile coverage across the UK. Um, at the moment, they share, the MNOs uh, share existing infrastructure to close most or all parts of the not, not or non-spots, as they call them, across the UK. Um, if implemented, this shared network would uh, be a positive move, increasing Northern Ireland's 4G coverage uh, from 78% of, of Northern Ireland to 91% and hopefully reduce uh, non-spots. Uh, DCMS are providing £500 million across the UK for that, with the mobile network operators contributing a further £530 million. However, the full details of the, the regional mapping and impact we will not have um, available until uh, later this year as to exactly how much of it will cover, but the anticipation is we would move up the coverage in Northern Ireland from 70 <coughs> to 91%. And has that worked to start this year? Um, I think that they are starting to roll out. I think be, they would be hopeful that they would be rolled out sometime later this year and into 21. Okay. Right, thank you. Just on the university, Sam, um, the University of Ulster, John has covered it quite a bit. There were obviously um, major contractual issues there. Is the programme, it's obviously running behind now, but is it running now to revise schedule? Yes, it is running to a revised schedule, um, so it will be, uh, I think, 2021. Before it's complete? Yes. 2021. And what is the projected overspend to date? Or? Um, I think it's 126 million. 126 million? Yeah, I, do, I don't have the exact figures um, with uh -huh. me, but um, again, Trevor Cooper, who's coming along, <coughs> is steeped in this, so uh, I wish to direct that question to him. He also is our man who has been dealing with Horizon 2020 mm -hmm. and possible Yes, I remember him coming here before yes. a number of occasions. Yes. That £126 million, is that is the department going to be liable for that or is there, are there still outstanding legal issues to resolve in relation to that? The, the, that is um, the figure that is the uh, addition of the financial transactions capital loan that right. has been requested, uh, and the close scrutiny that we will put on the project going forward would be to ensure that there is no more financial ask of government, that, that we're, if Department of Finance approves that, that we're signing off on that and that is the limit, and then we will need to have closer scrutiny of the project than we have had before, so we will uh, sit on project boards, etc., as observers to ensure that we are aware of any issues as they arise. And has this project been managed through project management, through the Department of Finance? Because universities are autonomous bodies, they are responsible for the management of their projects. Uh, the measures that we're putting in place now are because of the difficulties that they have got into, which also impacts on their financial stability. 
uh, and as a department we are more concerned with the, st the financial stability than anything else. So that's why uh, we were recommending the additional loan and also the conditions that attach to it. There are preconditions as well in terms of them demonstrating their financial sustainability going forward and the capability of their council and senior management. So those are preconditions before the, even the conditions attach to the loan. But this is after the failures have been identified? Yes. But prior to that, why were these um, processes and procedures not in place in a proper there was a system that managed the project as in line with, with policy? Well, again, because, because they are autonomous bodies and responsible for managing their own projects, um, the department's role in that was limited to uh, asking for regular update reports, uh, and we were aware for at least the last year that things were going wrong and that we were not receiving regular um, reports. Uh, it's our understanding also that the University Council were not getting full information and this has led to our concern over how the Council and the senior executive team uh, are interacting with each other. So, <coughs> as I say, um, we have not been asked for any money over the last year. It's subject to them producing business cases, and it took until recently before business cases were produced that we then scrutinised in great deal of detail and realised that there were also issues in business cases that needed to be looked at. So, it, you know, it was a period of, I guess, a bit of in inaction in terms of their project management. We <coughs> are fairly confident that they now have an appropriate project director in place and that it ha has been turned around, they have a better relationship with their contractor. So you know, we're, we're saying that we are more confident that this will be delivered when they're saying it will be delivered, but it is still not without risk. And that is why... Without risk? It's not without risk, because you know, there are still some elements of it that need to be bottomed out, such as fit-out and, and IT costs going into the building. But there's no doubt if you go there now, you can see that the, the work is ongoing. There's a period of time later on where they will require quite a substantial workforce, you know, so there would be issues about where's the workforce coming from and so on. But we are, as I say, much more confident that, that they will be able to deliver. Will the department be taking any um, future action to ensure that this type of failure does not happen again in relation to major capital schemes? Well, the department administered by bodies such mm -hmm. as universities. Mm -hmm. The department will be uh, putting in place fairly stringent capital project management arrangements for universities, such as the, we have very rigorous capital um, management arrangements in place for further education colleges mm -hmm. because they are non-departmental public bodies. So we will be putting similar arrangements in place, but we do have to be careful about the classification of universities as known public sector bodies. If you manage things too closely, it can be seen as control and it can be seen as bringing them into the public sector. So there's a balance that we have to work out. There's obviously a risk there that, that weren't managed, but we'll, we'll monitor that in the future all being well. Um, just in the, um, the colleges, I think we would all um, I think we'd acknowledge that a lot of good work has been done by the colleges and a, a lot of money has been invested in them too over not just even recent years but a number of years. And I know locally and the CERC College that we would have regular contact with have done an excellent job and continue to do that. Um, the 88 per cent on salaries does seem a bit disproportionate for, for their, their management structure. What has been done to try and address that issue? Um, well, it, it basically is because of you know it, it is a there are institutions that are made up of lecturers and, and I would their their management structure isn't excessive you know there has been a report done by Tribal Tribal that says that our colleges are lean so it is not that they have excessive management structures in place it is the sheer volume of, of activity that's going on so they have full time lecturers they have part time lecturers um, heads of department etc. They are high volume um, businesses, so they need the staff there. Uh, what is being done is we have a programme in place called Transform to Deliver, and that's looking at can we modernise contracts to ensure that there is more flexibility and agility for the programmes of the future. Um, that involves extensive negotiation with unions, and it, it's at quite 
a delicate stage, so you know, I don't want to go into too much detail on that. But again, the college principals and chairs are working very hard yeah. on that. Yeah. We are aware of the pressures. You know, we, we get regularly about the pressures. Our budget, budgets have been cut, as you've said. Uh, but uh, I do feel that needs to be looked at, but we need to continue to address the issue. Uh, the skills thing, the, the skills strategy has been talked about, and we've heard it before about the skills barometer. How successful has that programme been, this barometer, in measuring the skills that are out there and the, the needs to address them? The, the skills barometer is a piece of research that is done for us um, through the Ulster University Economic Centre, uh, and it, it's a you know it, it's quite unique in terms of the inform the richness of the information that's in there, and it can be broken down to regional levels and so on. Oh. And it will look at um, you know both the supply of skills and the demand for skills, mm -hmm. and then can tell us where there are these imbalances. So the, there are charts in there that show you where you know and, and numbers of where the the oversupply and undersupply is. So we obviously have an undersupply at levels four and five at the more sort of technical um, end of things, and yet. Um, our society's ambitions are for young people to go to universities and do level six. So that's why we have this gap at levels four and five. As a society, we need to value more um, the vocational and professional end of things and not just always seek that people will go to universities. Um, we have undersupplies at digital skills, engineering skills. We have oversupplies in teachers, uh, which I'm sure we're not surprised at. Um, but I think it's getting the messages across to young people as well. It's not just about being doctors, lawyers, and so on. There are so many rich careers out there that they should look at. OK, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Alan. Thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, Heather, you talked earlier about uh, the challenge of improving the images uh, of the further education colleges, and, and Gordon has uh, alluded to the Southeastern Regional College, and just want to place on record that the image of that college is excellent, I think largely due to the commitment of the leadership and the staff there. Uh, and it's certainly uh, a place that uh, has become the first choice of students rather than a last resort uh, fallback. But um, given the, the budget cuts and the staff pressures, um, do further education colleges still have the capacity and the flexibility to design courses, even at short notice, uh, to match uh, local employment opportunities that might be coming along in the pipeline? And an example of that was a number of years ago when uh, the Aurora Le Leisure Centre was been built in Bangor, where the, the college there was able to design a number of courses around skills that would be required uh, when that uh, leisure centre opened. Um, so I'm just wondering, do, can you still uh, have that flexibility to do that? Uh, and on a completely different topic, uh, can I ask if the department has done any work or would have any views on the uh, impact uh, that a reduced rate of uh, VAT applied uh, to hospitality sector services uh, in Northern Ireland would have? Okay, I'll, I'll answer the, the colleges one first and then maybe Dermot could talk about the, the VAT aspect. Um, I think that it is one of the strengths of our further education sector that they have the flexibility and the agility to respond very quickly to employer needs. Uh, far more quickly than universities can because they have processes to get courses in place. But further education colleges have been at the forefront of, of that flexibility and agility. Uh, and I think that the programme I talked about, Transform to Deliver, we're hoping that that will improve that flexibility uh, and agility. And they are very much, I think, that the ambition is for them to be at the heart of the communities and dealing with employers and recognising what those needs are and responding very quickly to those. But there is no doubt that they are under severe pressure with the budget cuts that they've had. They had end year flexibility um, when they were made, made NDPPs. That has now all been allocated. So there is nowhere for us to go in the future other than recognising that they are so important to our economy and investing properly in them. Um, so I think we've got that message out that that's going to be essential. But for me, it is about all of our institutions working together in better collaboration and not in competition. So that you know, universities should not be doing levels four and five and 
um, therefore reducing colleges' ability to do that as well, that we need to be uh, ensuring that it, the pathways are there, there are no barriers, and it's about the individual learner and how that fits with whatever is the best institution. And it's another reason for bringing in this traineeship. Um, <coughs> the aspiration would be that in the future, a young person at school might be able to think, well, I'm not academic. I would therefore like to do a vocational program that would get me the five GCSEs, which you could then maybe top up with some others at school, and that could be a first choice at an earlier age, not when they haven't got their GCSEs at school. But that was part of you know the 14 to 19 strategy, and looking at how can we make this system work better for the learners. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Chambers, could you repeat the question? Yes, just, uh, I'm just wondering if the department has done any work or would have any view on the impact uh, that uh, if there was a reduction in the VAT rate applied to hospitality services in Northern Ireland, what it would have. I know that the hospitality service have been lobbying and campaigning the last number of years for uh, a reduction to give them a level playing field uh, with the Republic of Ireland in terms of tourism services. So. Uh, I don't have that to hand, but certainly I, I can go back and uh, talk with our uh, analytical services unit to see if they have done any work. I think they yeah, I would be interested have. to hear that if you mm. maybe come back to me. I would appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. And if I could maybe add to this flexibility, uh, the announcement yesterday by Microsoft. I don't know if you picked up yes, in, yeah. on cyber security, the flexibility of the Belfast Met in the, actually working with them and putting a course in place quickly. That would actually train up the staff that they will require in the cyber security. I think that is an indication as to yep. that the colleges are moving to be quite flexible to working with employers and trying to get the right skills in That's place. To be welcome. Thank and you. It is to be welcomed. I could just make a slight over observation as well around the the, um, the pathways, the traineeships. I think it's really important that when we are developing our, our 14 to 19 strategy and our skills strategy that articulation there are no blockages if you do a traineeship that you can go on to an academic pathway in the future as well i think that's something Absolutely. we just need to reflect yeah. on claire thank you chair um and my apologies for missing your presentation um i suppose i want to come back to this point around funding for the higher education um sector um you had an expectation that Ulster University would provide you with regular reports in relation to the, the Belfast build, um, but you said they weren't forthcoming. As a, as a department, do you have any responsibility to have followed that up and to indeed have found that out? Well, the, the, the team actually always did follow up and go and ask, and we're aware and we're waiting for information to come back. We can't produce the information ourselves, but we certainly knew that there were problems and that when we did get some information and it wasn't adequate information, we went back and we asked for more information. And that's what then led to us commissioning a very detailed report through Deloitte's that also critiqued Ulster University's business case that they had prepared by PwC. So we were um, always requesting the information and always following up. It wasn't left to, to lie, so we were aware of problems we just weren't aware. No one was aware, not even the university, of the full extent of the problems. Okay. And given the autonomy that still exists between the department and the university, how are you able to provide that oversight now when you weren't previously able to provide that oversight? Is this a reaction to the, the, the kind of uh, difficulties that you know, Ulster University have had? Um, I suppose the question I'm really asking is, is could you have provided that oversight earlier if you are able to do it now, given that we have the same structures? Well, I think, as I said, we need to find a balance and we need to be very careful. So that's why we're, if we have people on project boards, they're there as observers, they're not there as members of the boards. Uh, and that we are able to put this in as terms and conditions of providing a loan. Okay. And we wouldn't have been able to do that before. But we are putting in terms and conditions now that any lender would have put in to these sorts of agreements. And, you know, given that the university is funded by public funds, would it not have been maybe prudent to put in similar terms and conditions at the outset so that we haven't actually found ourselves in quite a considerable overspend? I, th I think what we would have to say is that um, there were, really until 2017, there was no reason to be concerned. There was no reason to have these uh, mechanisms in place. And it's now when we are aware of the difficulties that we are seeking to put these conditions in place. As I say, it's a, it's a fine line to tread and we need to be very careful. And it, these terms and conditions are not terms and conditions that the university is particularly 
uh, contend with, but at the moment there is no choice. Yeah, and, and I suppose I appreciate you know the the kind of. Uh, the distance that needs to be kept between the department and the university. I suppose where I've always had a difficulty, and I remember making similar comments when I was on the Dell Committee a number of years ago, that um, this is publicly funded money. I do feel that the department could be doing more to provide a better oversight, and indeed you are now doing that. So you know, why not then, if, you could, if, it, if it's possible to do it now? I suppose on that point as well, is the minister minded to look at a potential funding council for uh, universities, as we would see in England and Wales, um, just to have that you know extra layer of scrutiny? that obviously needs, is needed? Um, well, the, the department is the funding council in the same way as the, the other funding councils operate. So, for example, I would attend meetings of the four funding councils on a regular basis. So we are, <coughs> we are providing the same function as the funding council would. I think this is, this is an exceptional case um, that no other funding council would have come across uh, in, in the past. But is the minister minded to potentially look at this government? It's not value for money to be creating a body when we are able <coughs> to carry out that function as a department. Even if we are now facing quite a considerable overspend, indeed if, you know, if that funding council in itself had a particular remit to oversee funding in regards to this, I would argue that potentially there is value for money there because obviously the, the, the department isn't able to. Well, there, there would really have been very little difference. Um, you know, if we had, if you've got two universities and the Open University, it isn't value for money to put a structure in place, but what we will be doing in the future is funding um, oversight of this particular project and other projects um, through the interest that would be charged on the loan in the future, so that will fund um, the, the necessary scrutiny that needs to be put in place. We have had major capital projects uh, through both universities over a long number of years, and we have never needed to do this before. Okay, but it's not in disrespect of, I suppose, capital um, expenditure. It would also be in respect of the resource and how they're spending their monies. And indeed, I think that's the role that the, the councils will perform in England and Wales. Again, is the minister minded to look at that potential option? We we do that role as well, um, and there is no problem with the uh, the role of monitoring resource uh, and providing the, the funding. Uh, we're working on a new funding model um, that's more appropriate to Northern Ireland um, because of the, the change in the arrangements uh, in England in particular. But as I say, we are in close contact with the Office for Students, with the Scottish Funding Council and so on, and we meet regularly. So the Minister's not minded? We have not put any advice to okay. the Minister to date on this issue. Um, in and around the medical school it's a com uh, in McGee, it's a commitment in the, the new decade, new approach. Can I ask, is that commitment in and around the capital funding to, to build the initial or, or, or will it be in resource? And um, I understand that there's an outline business case that would have been put before the Department of Health, please correct me if I'm wrong, and I understand that they haven't yet signed that off. Do you have any idea why they weren't prepared to sign that business case off? Um, well, the, the funding for the medical workforce is the responsibility of the Department um, of Health, and I believe that although they have a business case from Ulster University for the Graduate Entry Medical School, they then had to uh, put together a business case about the medical workforce in general, and they had not yet completed that business case. So until that's done, then they can't uh, make recommendations about the, the, the graduate entry medical school. But to say that's a, a matter for the for that department, not for our department. Okay, but you you would have a you would have a sense you you would have to work with the Department of Health, given that it's a higher education fu funded body. They, they would provide the funding and we distribute it. That's the way that works. Okay, but again, you would have an oversight in, in ensuring that the money that you're providing as a department is actually um, uh, viable. I well, we work closely with them in terms of medical education generally. Okay. Um, uh, you had mentioned uh, £35 million pounds for Causeway Coast and Glens, and you had um, alluded that there were difficulties in, in terms of uh, Causeway Coast and Glens maybe making use of that. Can, can I confirm, is that the growth deal that comes from the city? Do? I, I, I don't think there's any problems. I think that announcement from CLG was towards the tail end of last year. They are still looking at what they would put into within the scope of that deal. I don't think there's any problems. I think they're just at the very early stages of starting to work up what what a proposal to a growth deal would be for that council area. Okay. What would be included, what would not. So I suppose they're looking at the different options, the different permutations 
Uh, so I don't think there's any difficulties. I just think it's very early in the, in the cycle for, for okay. both that and the, the Mid-Ulster deal. OK. Um, and my last point, Chair, if you don't mind. Um, uh, you know, you, you raised a very valid point in and around vocational subjects. And, you know, typically we would say that the, the further education um, institutions would provide that. Um, I suppose what I'm saying, particularly within my own constituency as well, is that um, uh, post-primary schools, particularly in sixth form, are starting to offer vocational subjects where FE colleges are starting to feel the squeeze of that. And I suppose the difficulty there is around the funding model of uh, primary and post-primary then compared with the funding model for FE. I suppose, and I'm sure you are fully uh, uh, aware of the, the, almost the conflict of interest around that. And how are you working with the Department of Education to kind of raise that as a difficulty? Because I do think we might find that we're going to have less and less uptake of places in FE colleges if they're being provided at post-primary school with the end of actually providing them with funding. Well, again, it, it is specific work stream of the 14 to 19 strategy, uh, looking at funding and the issues. And quite often, you know, people who do stay on at school and, and do something along the vocational lines then find that it isn't what is required to progress and it has wasted their time. You know, so all of those issues are being explored within that 14 to 19 strategy and I think both committees are getting a, a joint um, presentation on that work to date. Thank you. Christopher. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for, for coming to speak to us. I just want to pick up on the thing that uh, Claire Sugden raised in terms of graduate entry medical school. What's the envisaged cost of that project? Um, I, from, from memory, um, I think that when it's fully operational, mm -hmm. it was is £30 million pounds per annum. £30 million. And what percentage, roughly, it at this stage is going to be capital investment? That thirty million is the revenue cost of running it. Okay. I actually don't know what the capital cost right. is. Okay. I would be interested just to get the the sort of relative ratio capital to revenue at this juncture because to my mind, um, thirty million pounds do an awful lot of expansion in medical training at Queen's rather than necessarily having to spend money on bricks and mortar elsewhere, but that's uh, cycle fast, fast speaking. Um, <laughs> just, I would be interested to get that information, uh, especially you mentioned about the theme of you know, universities going off on their own and, and not coordinating and competing against each other. You know, I think that is an important point. Speaking as a, as a history graduate who gave up STEM subjects as soon as he possibly could, and I want to ask you some questions about them. Um, <laughs> One of the things that you identified is a, a digital unders, undersupply and a technical skills gap within the workforce. Um, I would be interested to ask about coordination between the departments of education and the economy to allow for the provision of the teaching of coding in schools. Um, some of you might know Ian Simons, who's a lecturer at Stramalis College, produced the resources to teach start kids at primary school ages learning coding in schools and um, has been I've been pushing the department others have been pushing the Department of Education in terms of taking this on because I think that it would actually be really beneficial and I would just be interested in some information about where the teaching of coding is actually at in our schools because it seems to me an opportunity that's being missed I, I agree entirely with, with all of that, and I think that this is, is something that <clears throat> was looked at extensively by the CBI, and they have produced a report and an action plan, and it has various actions for all the different players in this, the Department for Education, our department, mm -hmm. um, employers themselves, and the about, you know, the, the employers providing that sort of secondary <clears throat> opportunity for people so that they can upskill the teachers as well, because some of this is where do the teachers get those skills. So that's all in that particular action plan that we are now working on taking forward. So, And the skills strategy will particularly reference this. Yes. Um, but again, you know, it's all very well producing strategies. Strategies need to be resourced. Uh, you know, and you know, we will need to then see what resources we will get in the future for all of this work. In terms of the um, graduate entry medical school and the competition or collaboration, I would have to say that, again, this is something where um, Ulster and Queen's have been <coughs> working together. So 
you know, that, that is really for them, but they are not seeing this as um, unnecessary competition. It is a different market, graduate entry students going in. The, there are difficulties with it. I mean, we, as policy position, do not fund people to do second degrees, so therefore there would have to be um, scholarships for this or people self-financing. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of that will have to be looked at in the business case and the Department of Health's business case will have to look at the sources of medical workforce wherever that comes from and make decisions. In terms of quantifiables, even at this early stage, <coughs> as you said, the Department doesn't fund uh, uh, beyond first degree. In terms of quantifiables, I mean, what's your hunch? Do you think it's sustainable as a project? Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to be perfectly honest, I haven't actually read the detail of the business case um, because it is a matter for the Department for Health. Uh, certainly, the business case needed to prove that it would be, otherwise the business case would not get through. Yeah. You know, so okay. that, that's all I would say on that one. Okay. Um, I, don't, I want to then jump on to something completely different. Um, in terms of the present arrangements the arrangement that arise out of the EU withdrawal bill, and potential customs um, situation that's going to pertain here. Do we have a figure in terms of the cost per single customs declaration that a, for, that a business moving stuff will have to uh, fill in? I wouldn't have that information. I would need to check. There is a, an entire uh, division within the department dealing with dealing the EU exit yep. and that's actually looking at, and I think uh, with They're a coming up, uh, coming up next week. Yeah, so that's the sort of information they may have done background research in. Okay. But obviously, until there's clarification as to exactly what would that be entailed, I certainly know that one of the issues identified in, in a no-deal scenario, when we were doing some uh, planning for that uh, previously, one of the issues in Northern Ireland is the, the number of customs clearance agents there are. Mm -hmm. That There uh, probably wouldn't be enough in customs clearance agents at the moment to deal with a massive increase in requirements for the paperwork for uh, customs declarations. And I think that's some, but again, I'm not uh, close to that area, Mr. Stafford, and uh, that team will have the details. Next week, yeah. yeah. That's grand. Okay. Thanks very much. Don't worry. John. Thank you. John. Hello, sorry. I want to return to the Austin University issue again because it's mentioned twice in the first day brief, which has been given to members from the department. Uh, on page Six, it refers to a £60 million investment in the 2021 year required by the university, which is on page 33 of the members' pack. 33 of the members' pack, yeah. Yes. Is that included in the £126 million, which yes, is that's, that's half of it. That's half it's of it? It's over two years. It's over two years, right? The other point then is 126 and 254 comes to 380 million rather than 370 million, which is the projected cost of the project now on page, again on page six. Are we giving them a bit of leeway? Or a lot of leeway? There may be some parts of it that, uh, that we believe that's for them to fund. Right. But if, so I, I, I note that it's up to 126 million. So there may that may not be the final figure. That's good. There may be less than that. Well, that, that is the figure for the loan. If there is any additional expenditure required over and above that, that is for them to fund. Yeah, but we, if we give them the hundred, or if the department uh, sponsors that transaction, that'll bring the total investment up to 380 million on a project which is currently forecast to cost 370 million. Um, th th there is perhaps something wrong with those figures, but again, could I ask you to ask Trevor the detail? Certainly, yeah. And, and just in terms of, and this may be Trevor's question as well, uh, in terms of the repayment of the loan, does the Ulster University repay that loan, or does the department repay that loan? No, Ulster University repays that loan. It is a loan from government to the university, and it's a repayable loan. And do you, are you aware of the interest rate on that? Um, I haven't got the detail of the interest rate. It is obviously lower than yeah. the bank's interest rate would be. You can forward that on to us if that's possible. Chair, just one other thing. In relation to um, the procurement processes that we've talked about earlier, Heather, 
Under the Department of Finance, there's a list of public bodies which Northern Ireland public procurement policies apply or policy applies. Uh, the Department of um, Finance is there, obviously, and the Department of the Economy are listed. Under other public bodies, it does mention um, Strand Millis University, it's now called. They are uh, obviously subject or can be subject to the government procurement processes that are, now, that are in in place, and yet the University of Ulster has, is not. Why, why is that the case? Um, well, universities, as I said, are uh, autonomous bodies, therefore they have their, they, they broadly follow, they, you know, they have to follow European procurement rules, um, mm -hmm. but they're not public bodies, therefore they're not subject to... And why do you say Strand Millis? Strand Millis is a non-departmental public yeah. body. It is. Yes, because the department appoints to their board, so Is therefore you? they got reclassified at the same time as further education colleges. Now that would be something that we may wish to look at in the future and bring forward. It can only be changed through legislation, mm -hmm. yeah. so that's why it has not been done to date, but it is something to look at in the future. I think it needs to be right. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Just a point, maybe. If it's, uh, could, could we get a copy of the Deloitte report? Yeah. And to the EU, uh, the Department Commission to Deloitte report, I think you yes. said, Heather. Yes. Um, I think it would be an interesting reading for the committee to have a copy of that. I, I will check that out for you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Sinead, um, Heather, just again, I want to speak about the review of higher education. And uh, when will that be complete? <coughs> and are you looking at the MASM cap? Um, Which review is this, sorry? The review of higher education. Further. Review of further, further and higher, sorry. Um, it will look at that aspect of it that is for yeah. higher education and further education. But, I mean, again, what I, what I would want to say on MASN is that that is simply a function of the total money that we have available. It is, um, you know, it's just sensible. We, we have to have a limit, otherwise we can't afford the students that are going to universities. If we had you no know, full fees, and, uh, then we wouldn't need a cap on the student numbers. But we are where we are, and as long as we have um, lower fees and an amount of public funding that doesn't bring it up to fees elsewhere, then we cannot afford not to have a cap. Caps were only removed in England when they went to 9,000 fees and universities therefore had full funding available. There are caps in Scotland as well where they also have limits to their budget. Um, and we work backwards from the money that we have, and that's what it is. But we also we would put um, uh, a total number for each of our universities. It is then up to them how they distribute that across their courses. You know, so if sometimes people say, "Oh, it's ridiculous," there is a cap on digital skills. We didn't impose mm. that cap. That was the university's decision as to how they distributed their total numbers. You mentioned that there was an oversupply for teachers, for example, yet um, there is MASM against that, or there is numbers against that, student numbers against that, they're not required. You know, I think fundamentally the, the department has to work with the university in order to make sure that we're not uh, educating people and having actually no, no outlet, no jobs, no anything. You might as well give them a... a, a uh, a car to leave the country because they're not going to get jobs here, full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the actual numbers, student numbers for uh, initial mm -hmm. teacher education is uh, calculated by the Department for Education mm -hmm. using the, the, a formula. Um, and again, this is a decision for yourselves as politicians rather than for the departments. And then finally, I just want to talk about the expansion of um, the university within the McGee campus in Enderry, and that's the rural expansion, and a business case has been presented by the, to the department. Um, where do you sit with that in relation to moving that forward? To the, the, business, the business case that was presented to the department was presented a number of years ago, and given where we are with Ulster University, we would require a new business case for that, and we did write to the university uh, last year and asked them for that new business case and their council was not in a place to take that forward at that time and I would say that given where we are with Ulster University that is still the case that um, you know deliver that major capital project and then let's see where we are 
there, the, there are issues of capacity and capability. So you're saying quite categorically now that a new business case is required for the expansion of the The current business case is not fit for purpose, nor your confidence in their ability to actually deliver that or at this particular at this time. point in time. At in but the short would, term. In the short term. And what do you regard as short term? Because we're in Derry, we've been waiting 60 years for this, so I'm just wondering, what is short time? Well, again, a business case needs to be produced, first and foremost, and we do not have a current business case that stacks up. Yeah, no. Okay. Thanks. And, you know, again, the business case we had before, the one that is very out of date, was 300 million capital and 100 million resource that we just do not have. Uh, and unless there's new money, it's hard to see how, you know, how that would happen. Because when there is new money, it goes to health and schools. It doesn't come anywhere near this department and, and higher education. You've indicated that the OECD report has um, one of the, the, the five objectives is about skill balance. Uh, throughout Northern Ireland, making sure that there is a skill balance. I would argue that there isn't a skill balance. There is an oversupply of, of skills here within based and, and, and very, very little in the West. So there is no skill balance. And in order for us to, again, you know, create a balanced economy that uh, has got high productivity and that we can have good wages right across the province, we need a skilled balance. And the only way to do that is to look at our further and higher education uh, and put resources to where they are under uh, under supplied at this moment in time. But, but you know, we'll, we'll, what, what I would say is that the department has no views one way or the other on that, but we simply do not have a business case. If there's a business case that stacks up that is brought to us, and if there's money to fund that business case, we have absolute difficulty with that at the moment. We have no business case, and there's no funding. But Heather, I think the department, which is us around here, I think we all have a view in it. We need Northern Ireland to work, not just part of it, all of it. And therefore, we have to make sure that our skill strategy and our funding and our resources are put to good use throughout Northern Ireland, not just in part of it. So. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk to the, the, the Minister about that at another time. Claire? Thank you, I know you're for time. Um, I, I suppose it's to pick up around the, the Mazen cap and the, the funding model. I suppose one of the biggest criticisms that, that would come from Ulster University is around the fact that they're not funded for a multi-campus model. Are there any opportunities outside of the current funding model or any examples? And I appreciate there's probably very little because it's quite a unique uh, uh, circumstance in relation to the multi-campus, but you know, so that that can be considered, because there are obvious, you know, there there are inevitable costs that comes with having a number of campus campuses across the, the region. Again, what I would say is that our funding that we have is limited, and any such decisions mean taking funding off somewhere else, um, and and that is is difficult, uh, and you no, know, there isn't um, any kind of history of other universities being full funded for multi-campuses, because mm -hmm. generally that is a decision for the university as to where they locate. Yeah. And it would have to be part of business cases in order to do so. Yeah. So there isn't a fund elsewhere mm -hmm. that is dedicated to multi-campus yeah. provision. I suppose I, I appreciate that, but I suppose the comment I would make is that that is the reality of, of, of where we are. And certainly if we were to remove campuses from certain parts of Northern Ireland, the, the, the consequence that that would have for, for other uh, industries, like so for example the tourism industry, you know, we, we talked at length about event tourism, but certainly in the winter months when we don't have those big events, it's the students that are keeping, you know, the seaside towns, my constituency, Corian, you know, and, and I appreciate that, that you may say that that's not necessarily our remit, but you know, as a government moving forward, we have to look at this strategically and we have to look at how economy affects higher education education, how it affects tourism, how, yeah. how it affects all these different things. And I suppose where, where I would like to see the Minister um, is considerate on that basis, rather than just saying we don't have um, an interest. We should have an interest, because it's all of Northern Ireland that will be affected, and not just the Department for Economy. 
some of the comments I feel are starting to go back to that old silo mentality, and I appreciate we've only two years to fulfil a very um, ambitious set of aims in this mandate, but I, I think if we're going to start moving forward and genuinely trying to improve governance in Northern Ireland and uh, trying to um, get Northern Ireland to a point where it is somewhat self-sustainable, we need to look at this in the round, and we need to be looking at it in terms of outcomes, which indeed I understand is what the programme for government will do whenever it is finally published. So, um, and I, I think that sort of adds on to some of the comments yeah. you made was making as well. So, and I, and I don't disagree with anything that anyone has said. I am just cognizant of the reality of our budget allocation and what we can do. Yeah. John. Uh, Heather, at first you've got the worst day of the stick today. I, I, I commit to giving Dermot a far more harder time at the next meeting than he's got at this one. But it's, it's, it's just in relation to come back to Shalene's comments. In fairness, you're factually correct. The business case at this stage doesn't stack up in terms of the department's calculations. But it's also fair to say there has been no business case conducted since the new day, new decade, your approach, whatever it's called, has been published. And in that, you have commitments from the Irish government and the British government to provide funding to the McGee campus, both capital and revenue. So the future business case the department will conduct would take into account those commitments, though. We have seen how the British government have reneged some of the financial commitments in recent times, but however, if it, so a future business case would take place in a different circumstances than the previous one. Yes, and, and as I said to you, that we, we don't have any, you know, we're not putting blockages in this. Mm. We need a business case and we need to know where the funding is coming from, and that's it. Okay. <laughs> But and just finally, if, if I could add to, to that, um, within the new decade, new approach as well, there are the commitments to regional balance and um, resourcing on the basis of need, and I, I, that will all have to be built into our economic strategy and every other strategy that, that we are bringing forward. So that should hopefully address some of the issues that have been raised. Thank you both very much, Thank um, and I'm sure we'll have you both back in, in the future. I better warn Trevor. Yes. Of all the yeah. Okay, so we have no matters arising, so we move on then to um, item six on your agenda is the SRs relating to student finance. Um, and two of the officials that will be briefing us about, about these. What page is it? They're coming in. Um, sorry, it's on Absolute. page 108 yeah. of your sorry, pack. Yeah. So, um, Trevor and John. <laughs> but um, members, just for your attention, Jonathan O'Callaghan is um, incorrectly um, designated as being from Dell in your original, the original paper. Agenda, so. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'd like to welcome both Trevor Cooper and Jonathan O'Callaghan um, to our meeting today, and they are going to give us a brief outline of the statutory rules, and in particular highlight any significant changes that have been brought about by the rules, and then uh, members may want to ask some questions very, very about that. To be very brief, and we have to be very brief because we will have to get through. through. Okay, thank you. Um, so these regulations um, cover support for students taking designated higher education courses in respect of academic years 1718 to 1920 inclusive. They cover the levels of maintenance support towards living costs available to students in those years. Um, maintenance support consists of maintenance grants of 3,475 for students from household incomes of up to 19,203 for 1920. That amount tapers for those students from household incomes above 19,203 and below 41,066. And no maintenance grant support is payable to those students from household incomes of 41,066 and above. The grant is paid at the same rate for those living at home or away from home, and the support is available. Sorry, the support's payable from the Northern Ireland Resource Dell budget, and the total Resource Dell funding for maintenance grants was 60 million in 2018-19, the latest year. Um, 
There is further non-repayable support uh, available under the regulations to eligible students, uh, and that's those students with disabilities or occurring responsibilities. Um, these have been maintained at previous levels, and around £7 million was spent on that area in 18 months. And again, that £7 million was payable out of the Northern Ireland Resource Trail budget. In addition to maintenance grant support, the regulations also cover loan support towards living costs. And unlike the maintenance grants, the loan support is payable out of annually managed expenditure, which is funded via HM Treasury. The maximum loan support is 3750 for those students living at home, 4840 for those living away from home but outside London, and 6780 for those living in London. And the amount of loan available reduces uh, for those who are also in receipt of maintenance grant, um, which is why we talked about the tapering of uh, maintenance grant, um, but does not, it doesn't taper for those in receipt of what's called special support grant, which is effectively the same product as maintenance grant, but it relates to those who are single parents, those who over, are over 60, those having a disability, uh, and those in receipt of certain benefits. Uh, so with the exception of those in receipt of that special support grant whose loan entitlement is not means tested, the maximum loan and grant maintenance support available is 5,388 for those living at home, 6,428 for those living away from home and outside London, and 8,368 for those living in London. And there has been no change to those figures over the three years covered by those regulations. Okay. Can I just, um, and it's not a technical question about the rules, but just in sure. relation to some of the the, um, the the grant figures that you have outlined. Sure. Um, so the, the actual maintenance grant and the support that goes to those with care and responsibilities or disabilities, those figures have remained the same, so there hasn't been an inflationary uplift in those in over a number of years? That's correct, yeah. So that's effectively a, a real terms cut that students may be facing year on year in terms of the grant support that they're accessing, whereas the loan support has actually increased year on year? No. The lo um, loan support hasn't? The loan support has also uh, been flat. Since the, the same period? Yeah. yeah. Tuition fee loans have increased yeah. over that period, but the, the maintenance is yeah. not standard. Okay. Oh, sorry? The, the tuition, the, fee, tuition fees have increased the, over the period. But the, yeah. the, the amounts actual... covered in these regulations haven't been either for maintenance grant or loan. Uh, maintenance loan support towards living costs. Both so the maintenance loan maintenance. has also remained the same while the tuition fees have went up year on year? Okay. Thank you. Does do, anyone have, else have do any? You know, and what we might do is if we ask, Chair of the officials, just to stay where you are for now while we go through the statutory rules, because we do have a couple of questions for Mr Cooper in between um, on other issues, simply because you're here. <laughs> so if we, if, we, if we just hold both of you there and we start to go through the... Um, we start to go through the SRs as they are. So if you go to page five, and I know, sorry, start at page four, okay. six point two. So, um, if members can refer to um, point six point two, the statutory rule and explanatory memorandum in relation to SR twenty nineteen thirty five, the Education and Student Support Number Two, etc. Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland twenty nineteen, which is at page one hundred and eight. This rule is subject to negative resolution. Our members content that with the SR. So that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 219.35, the Education Student Support No. 2, etc. Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2019, and has no objection to the rule subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report. Okay. Yeah. 
Yep, perfect. Yeah. Um, then 6.3 in your packs, um, the statutory rule and explanatory memorandum in relation to SR 2018-35, which is page 127 of your um, pack. This is also subject to negative resolution. That the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2018-35, the Education Student Support Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2018, and has no objection to the rule subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. Okay, great. Great. So, six point four. Six point four then. Um, SR 2017-43, which is at page 138 of your pack. Um, also subject to negative resolution, that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2017-43, the Education Student Support Amendment No. 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2017, and has no objection to the rules subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. Members content. Great. 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 Um, so, so we are moving on to then seven. to 7.1. Sure, General, I'm assuming you have nothing further to say for the SRs that are not subject to procedure. If I just highlight to members once again, um, SRs that aren't subject to a procedure effectively fall out of the primary legislation and, and don't work like the negative resolution that we've previously looked at. That aside, um, rather than simply noting them, um, as would be the normal procedure, what we're asking the committee to do is again indicate that they are content with the concept. Um, it's just adding a little bit of extra scrutiny um, that we feel is important for the record. So, Chair, if you want to proceed with 7.1. Okay, one. so 7.1 is SR 2018-139 at page 151 of your pack. This rule is not subject to assembly procedure. So, that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2018-139, the Education Recognised Bodies Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2018, and has no objection to the rule subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report. Members are content, yeah. Great. So 7.2 then is SR 2018-69, which is page 5 of your table papers. Again, not subject to assembly procedure. That the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2018-69, the Employment Rights Increase of Limits Order, Northern Ireland 2018, and has no objection to the rules subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report. Members content. Excellent. Okay. Okay, so there was a couple of questions, Trevor, that came up in the previous briefing with Heather. Oh, really? Um, she said. So one was in relation to Horizon 2020. I think that was Gordon. Yeah. Do you want to pick it up then? Yeah, just in relation to something we, the committee actually done a report on it some years ago. Or the, the previous committee, you probably remember that, Trevor. And uh, just how is that developing now, obviously, as we move out of Europe and the consequences of that. How do you think that funding will follow in relation to that? And Trevor, sorry, and if I could add to that, um, I had also asked around Horizon Europe mm -hmm. and yeah. what and Heather says that there was some new developments in terms of um, replacement for Horizon twenty twenty or where we may be going in terms of Horizon Europe. My understanding was we may continue to be able to access that. Okay. Um, well, look, Hor Horizon 2020, there shouldn't be any... Which we're now in. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Finally. We are indeed. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I've actually no, no. <laughs> um, we've, we've actually performed pretty well um, in Horizon 2020 versus um, the previous uh, framework programme 9. Um, so... By my recollection, I think that we've drawn down over 85 million euro um, of funding. Um, now, the previous executive had set us a target of 145 million over the lifetime of that programme. So, you know, I can't commit that we're absolutely going to meet that target, but the trajectory is very, very positive. Um, we shouldn't. The, the Treasury has. Uh, there's a guarantee in place in relation to any funding for future projects under Horizon 2020. So there should be no issue with that program. The replacement program Horizon Europe. There are a number of options that are available to the United Kingdom um, post exit of the EU. So there is what is called association. So full association basically gives you 
access to most, if not all, elements of the programme on a on an almost yeah. You have to pay in. Um, so the United Kingdom would would uh, make a decision. Uh, is the Horizon Europe program going forward um, worth this amount of money? So there would be, if, if that, that's one option. The second option um, uh, is more restricted, so you would still have access to Horizon Europe, but uh, you would have access to less elements of the program. And that's called third country participation. So. There would be elements of the programme that we do at the minute, and actually, uh, under third country participation, um, there's an element called the Marie Curie element, where Northern Ireland gets a pretty large chunk of funding that wouldn't uh, be accessible under that option. The final option available is a national UK alternative to Horizon Europe, so the UK <coughs> could decide not to be involved in Horizon Europe as either a member or a third country, um, and would set up its own national scheme. Uh, now, my understanding is that no decision has been made on any of those options, so at the moment um, BEZ, our counterpart department in Whitehall, are developing a business case which is looking at full association, third country participation and indeed a national alternative. Um, uh, they're developing the business case. We're feeding in um, to that business case our experience of the Horizon uh, 2020 programme, the sort of projects, the amount of funding that Northern Ireland gets, the benefits from it. We're feeding in um, the sort of uh, areas that if the UK were to participate in Horizon Europe, Northern Ireland, uh, from a Northern Ireland perspective, would be very beneficial uh, for those sorts of areas to be the areas that the United Kingdom, say it were a third country, pushed to be able to participate in. Uh, and indeed, if there were a national alternative, we're feeding in to uh, the sort of um, approach to delivery, um, the sort of issues around funding for Northern Ireland and any such national alternative. So no decision has been made on any of those. We're having very close interaction with Bayes in relation to the way forward. Good. So okay. just on, on that then, I assume the universities are... Um, very much so. Expressing mm. their so. very strong I views. <coughs> obviously, for our universities, they would face the competition then in terms of research staff and students that have an option here on, on the same island in terms of um, accessing research programmes and being continued to access Horizon Europe through other universities. Yeah, well, you know, we're, we're pretty close engagement again with um, the universities here uh, in terms of their views on uh, the Horizon programme and, uh, you know, I met uh, the head of Church of Queen's last, I think it was last Friday, and we had a discussion around all of that. So, you know, we take on board the university's views um, as part of <coughs> the development and part of our interaction um, and our views are very important. Um, and the day, obviously, the department and the minister will um, and just in terms of what you mentioned, potential third party or third country access, so that you could potentially look, access individual streams of Horizon Europe, yeah, under but not but, but not all the programmes yeah, that you could choose. But uh, as I said, one of the most important streams to us at the minute wouldn't be available under that uh, that option. Thanks, Gordon. Did you want to? We well, just uh, make the point. A lot of the money that was drawn down was through universities, really. Um, Three major manufacturers like uh, Bombardier or what was Bombardier? Very much so, and that remains the case mm -hmm. in, in, yeah. in, in the current program. The universities are, uh, you know, well, and we, you know, it's two thirds, three quarters of the funding is still uh, going on way. with university participation. And in fact, over over fifty percent of the projects are also 
also involve a north-south relationship as well. Um, uh, the, so the sort of obviously there's a natural. You had to have partners in it, hadn't you? Yeah. You do. Yeah, you European do. partners at that time. Yeah, European partners. That was always a bit of an issue for the small business yeah. sector. You know, they <coughs> busy doing the day job to start into all of that, mm-hmm. and it was rather complex for them. It didn't really work its way out into the SMEs yeah. the way it should have. But yeah, and and that's again in, in the alternatives in the in the sort of national work stream. That's an area that uh, is being looked at. What I should say, do we, whether or not there's full association, third country participation or other, uh, to, to participate in Horizon Europe, there would still be a gap period. So there would be a period between access to Horizon 2020 and association or third country participation in Horizon Europe where um, you wouldn't be able to access that funding. So there's also work going on with Whitehall uh, and ourselves. Sorry, that's in the future programme, not in the current Horizon 2020 programme. There's no issue about that until the end of that programme. But for the future Horizon Europe programme, there probably would be a gap period. And again, Whitehall are looking at funding... uh, in relation to that gap period, so there would be support available for international research and development collaboration in any gap period, which obviously would be working to be as short as possible. Okay, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Trevor. Okay, so the other question, Trevor, was actually quite a straightforward one. It was in relation to the financial transaction capital loan that's been uh, made to UU. What would the interest rate is on that? Um, the interest rate's quarter percent. Quarter percent, okay. So can we also just get clarity as to why the, the offer being made amounts to three eighty when the project is forecast at three seventy? Sorry, the the, the the total project cost estimated at this stage is three hundred and seventy million pounds. The uplift being provided through the financial transaction is 126 million, which would bring the total project to 380 million. So, Um, sorry, there is there there is a conditional offer Mm. um, subject to Department of Finance approval um, that has been made for 126 million. So it's not for. For 300 and no, but, but uh, just let me clarify the point. Uh, the current finance available is 254 million, is my understanding. Okay. Right? <coughs> the conditional offer uh, awaiting approval by the Department of Finance is 126 million. Yeah, the estimated costs or the cost of the project we've been told is 370 million, but 254 and 126 is 380. Sorry, I would need to come back to you That's on, fair enough, yeah. on this. Um, I'm not sure when, when you talk about the 254, I'm not sure where that figure comes from. From the department's or first aid brief. Right. In, we'll in chair, term, if, if, um, if members are content... Sorry, we'll sorry, I picked you up incorrectly. Sorry, I thought you meant 254 loan funding no. uh, available. So... Um, The amount that has been offered is on foot of the forward cash flows and funding requirements of the project. And cash flow and project cost can be different things in terms of arriving at a peak funding requirement. Um, and some of the funding is coming from the university itself and will be generated out of its cash flow at a certain point in time. So that can then mean that the, the sort of cash requirement differs uh, from um, what you might expect at any given point in time if you're just looking at a, at a sort of total. But look, it's very t- 
tricky for me off the top of my head yeah, I'll just I'll just to uh, give you an absolute answer to your question without having the figures in front of me. Chair, what we'll do is we'll add it into the um, Dallow readout and, and we, we'll be specific mm -hmm. about what we're looking for and then we can highlight where in the chair or they okay. Sorry, or stay I'm brief we're looking. But just so that you know it's coming. That's fine. Um, <laughs> now there will be some you know okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry, here the chair. Just on a different matter completely. Can I get a breakdown of how much money that we spend on Northern Ireland students mm. uh, studying outside of Northern Ireland? Certainly. Have you got any idea per annum what it would be off the top of your head? Uh, not off the top of my head. Um, over a third of students study outside Northern Ireland, some of them by choice, um, some of them by choice, um, some not. Uh, students who study outside Northern Ireland other than students other than those in receipt of maintenance grant. Sorry? Other than those in receipt of maintenance grant, their support is <coughs> the tuition fee uh, support, so it's 9,250 uh, tuition fee support, so it doesn't score against the Northern Ireland block. Mm -hmm. It's treasury funded. Mm -hmm. um, again, their maintenance grants are funded here from resource Dell here and any maintenance loan support that they would get would be funded from annually managed expenditure by Treasury but we can come back with a breakdown of the Northern Ireland resource Dell uh, amounts from maintenance support tuition fee support uh, from the annually managed and the loan support from annually managed expenditure as well but they're funded from Different, different, yeah. different pots, for want of a better description, and some of it falls directly on Northern Ireland, some doesn't. I'd like to just understand uh, that better. Fine. Okay. Certainly. No problem. Thanks, Chair, we do that. Okay. So Thank you. We know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Get off late, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be another time. Uh. It will be another time. So we're moving on then to item Brilliant. 8, which is the SRs on um, industrial relations. Um, and we will have officials briefing us in relation to these as well. And um, I'm going to welcome to the meeting then Colin, Jack, Kelly Sprott and Darabla Redmond, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so, the, if I could just ask the officials to give us a brief outline of the statutory rules that we're considering today. Okay, uh, I suppose first I'll introduce myself and my colleagues. I'm Colin Jack, Director of Business and Employment Regulation in DFE. Um, Kelly Sprott um, is uh, the Head of Employment Relations Policy and Legislation Branch 1, and Dervla has been Head of uh, Employment Relations Policy and Legislation Branch 2 within the division. And uh, between, between us, we have been responsible for these uh, statutory uh, regulations that have um, gone through uh, during the period when we have no ministers uh, and I mean they cover the whole period really so some of them are going back a long way and uh, our uh, level of personal involvement in some of them was, was, was quite low but nonetheless uh, we, we'll do our best to explain uh, what they do. Um, the first ones uh, from 2017 about uh, qualified persons and independent scrutineers. Um, uh, members of the, the committee will be aware that whenever trade unions uh, ballot their members um, on, for example, industrial action or the election of a general secretary, um, and uh, the 
department has a, a body, the Industrial Court, which um, uh, looks at issues around union recognition. Um, so what these uh, pieces of legislation do is they appoint a set of organisations or individuals who can conduct those um, ballots uh, in a way which um, stands up to scrutiny. They're required to report on the conduct of the ballot afterwards. Um, and um, we came to a position that um, every few years um, there's a need to refresh the panel of organisations which can do that on behalf of trade unions or the industrial court. Um, and there was a need identified to do that during 2016. Uh, the minister at the time uh, Simon Hamilton had agreed um, that the exercise should be carried out in Northern Ireland uh, alongside an exercise uh, for Great Britain. And um, there was a, a competition held at that time where um, organisations that wanted to carry out that role applied. Uh, and uh, our department was represented on a panel that considered those applications. Um, there were uh, I think it was six yes. organisations appointed, um, and uh, the, uh, the the regulations simply name those organisations and regularise the position. Uh, and the decision was taken to go ahead with those regulations, given that the minister had agreed to the process being carried out and Northern Ireland being involved in it. Um, so um, then, if we move on to the. Um, the next set of regulations, which were made at the beginning of this year, um, SR 20, 20, 2, 3 and 4, um, these are all related to the introduction of early conciliation um, of employment disputes, uh, which uh, came into effect on Monday of this week. Um, the, uh, this was really, I suppose, the main new uh, policy area that was introduced by the 2016 Employment Act um, and uh, what this requires is any individual who has an employment dispute that under the previous circumstances they would have brought to uh, the Industrial Tribunals or the Fair Employment Tribunal as a, a claim, they need to contact the Labour Relations Agency and be offered the opportunity of uh, conciliation, early conciliation, before they can lodge a claim to the tribunal. Um, there's no obligation on people to uh, to take up that offer, but um, there's, there's quite a body of evidence that it is effective for people to, uh, to try and resolve employment disputes in a less formal way, rather than go to the cost and stress of tribunal proceedings. Um, so um, th that's something we consulted on as part of the Employment Law Review uh, back in 2013-2014. The provision was made in the 2016 Employment Act, and these are the, the pieces of secondary legislation required to bring it into effect. Um, we did the, the work was paused uh, for a, a little bit of time while we assessed whether we could uh, move the work forward uh, in light of the the Buick uh, case um, uh, which, which put limits on what decisions could be taken in the absence of ministers uh, we then brought this forward under the procedure for uh, decision making by uh, permanent secretaries um, and carried out a public interest test uh, and because this was very clearly the will of the Assembly back in 2016 uh, and there was quite a body of work that needed to be carried out between the department, the LRA and the tribunals uh, to, to put it into effect. Uh, we've been working intensively on this over the last year or so, so it has come into effect um, on, on schedule at the beginning or of, of this week. Um, and sort of associated with it, there's a new set of rules for the tribunals in general. Uh, previously, there were separate rules for the industrial tribunals and the Fair Employment Tribunal. Um, SR 2020 number three uh, unifies those rules and, and makes sure now that there's one set of rules to cover both. Uh, tribunals, uh, and that really simplifies the process for all involved in bringing claims to the tribunal. Um, then, um, if I go on to um, 
the, the, the number of other, so those were the uh, regulations that were subject to negative resolution. Uh, there are a number of regulations which uh, have their own procedure or have, have no, um, no procedure. Most of these are commencing, or are commencement orders, commencing provisions of the uh, 2016 Employment Act. Um, number one, which came in in 2017, uh, made some changes to the arrangements uh, in relation to individuals, workers who uh, are whistleblowers in relation to issues that they want to uh, raise concern about uh, without having a negative Im impact on their employment situation. Uh, so that was um, number one. Um, number two, which came in in 2018, um, make some changes to the um, arrangements for um, awards by industrial tribunals and others. Uh, for example, um, there's a there's a payment that individuals are entitled to. It's a maximum uh, payment in lieu of a week's salary or a week's wages in the event of a redundancy, for example, um, and. Uh, those payments are uh, upgraded in line with inflation every year. Um, the new process that came in under the 2016 employment makes a tangible change in how that uh, those those payments are, are subject to uh, the rate of inflation. Um, the, the the amounts are now rounded to the nearest pound, whereas previously, depending on the size of the payment, they were rounded either to the nearest 10p, 10 pounds, or 100 pounds. And there was a concern that the previous uh, methodology was resulting in uh, increases that were above the rate of inflation. So that was actually a process that had been introduced in GB a few years earlier. Um, and uh, in fact, it has meant there is a, there's a slight gap now between the payments in GB and Northern Ireland. The ones in Northern Ireland are slightly higher, but those um, increase of limits orders, uh, we made a final one under the old regime uh, in 2018 uh, before commencing, uh, before doing the number two commencement order, and then we did. Uh, an order, an increase in limits order in 2018 under the new procedure, and we did one then in 2019. So uh, we will be due to do one for 2020 shortly. Um, and then uh, the number three uh, commencement order is simply uh, the one that's related to the early conciliation procedures. Okay. Does any members have any questions? Nope. In relation to um, yes, <laughs> in relation to the ones that are subject to negative resolution, has there been any issues has come up since they've been put in place? No, uh, not that I'm aware of. No, no, we should be aware of. No, generally positive stuff. No, right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. 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 So if we just hold you there for now, sorry, just until we go through them, chair, if that's okay. Okay, okay. we'll be, we'll be, yeah. not be, we'll not be. So, um, 8.1 on the, the agenda, and that's SR 2017-323, which is page 155 of your packs. It's subject to negative resolution. Um, that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2017-223, the recognition and derecognition ballots qualified persons amendment order Northern Ireland 2017, and has no objection to the rules subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. Content, yeah. right. So 8.2 then is SR 2017-224, which is page 160 of the pack and also subject to negative resolution. That the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2017-224, the Trade Union Ballots and Elections Independent Scrutiny Qualifications Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2017, and has no objection to the rule subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report. 8.3 yeah. then is SR 2020-02, and that's page 165, um, also subject to negative resolution. That the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2020-02, the Industrial Tribunals and Fair Employment Tribunal Early Conciliation Exemption and Rules Put Up Procedure, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule subject to examiner of statutory rules report. Great. Great. 
um, 8.4 then, which is SR 202003, and it's page 177, also subject to negative resolution. That the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 202003, the Industrial Tribunals and Fair Employment Tribunal, Constitution and Rules of Procedure, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rules subject to the Examiner Statutory Rules Report. 8.5 then is um, SR 202004, which is page 238 of your pack, also subject to negative resolution. That the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 202004, the Industrial Tribunal's 1996 Order, Application of Conciliation Provisions Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rules subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report. So we're moving on then to 9.1, which is SR 2017 199 at page 251. This is, rule is not subject to assembly procedure. Um, that the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2017 199 C12, the Employment Act Northern Ireland 2016 Commencement Number 1 Order Northern Ireland 2017, and has no objection to the rule subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report. Members are content. Yes. Great. 9.2 then is SR 2018-79, which is page 254 of your pack, also not subject to assembly procedure. But the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2018-79-C7, the Employment Act Northern Ireland 2016 commencements, Commencement No. 2, Order Northern Ireland 2018, and has no objection to the rules subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report. Members are content. Great. Great. So 9.3 then is SR 2018-80, which is page 257 of your pack, also not subject to assembly procedure. That the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2018-80, the Employment Rights Increase of Limits No. 2, Order Northern Ireland 2018, and has no objection to the rules subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report. Members are content. Great. Um, 9.4 then is SR 2019-63, page 265 of your pack, also not subject to assembly procedure. That the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2019-63, the Employment Rights Inclusive Limits Order, Northern Ireland 2019, and has no objection to the rule subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report. Members are content. Great. Um, 9.5 then is SR 2020-01, page 273 of your pack, also not subject to the Assembly procedure. That the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2020-01, the Employment Act, Northern Ireland 2016, Commencement No. 3, Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report. Sure, right. yep. um, then moving on to... I wonder we have them going now. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think we might need to some of these pieces of legislation. Just to make sure that that will be Thank you very much. Thanks. 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 SR 2020-12, the Seafarers Collective Redundancies, Information and Consultation and Insolvency, Miscellaneous Amendments, Regulations. <laughs> um, so the copy of the statutory rule and the explanatory memorandum are at page 386 of your pack and 291, respectively. Um, this rule implements certain requirements of an EU directive with the purpose to place those employed on sea on equal footing with those um, land-based employees and to remove unequal treatment across member states. Um, this rule is also subject to negative resolution. So if members are content, we'll yep. put the question. Yep. Great. Great. That the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2020-12, the Seafarers Collective Redundancies, Information and Consultation and Insolvency Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule subject to the examiners of statutory rules report. Thank you, members. Okay, so moving on then to item 11, which is the Electricity and Gas Internal Markets Regulations 2020. Um, there is a letter from the Minister regarding the statutory instrument at page 296, copy of the regulations at page 297, and then the explanatory memorandum at 309. 
The Minister has written to advise that the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy intends to lay a regulation on the 3rd of February 2020, which include the ENA provisions, um, that the regulation amends UK legislation for consistency with the electricity regulation and agency regulation that were adopted in June 2019 as part of the EU's Clean Energy Pack of um, legislative measures. The Minister has stated that the legislative amendments are not contentious and do not constitute any policy changes. So, members have any issues on those? No. Nope. Essentially, we're in breach and this is to close the breach. So, mm -hmm. if members are content, we proceed to get the SR sent down. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, we're then moving on to item number 12, which is the annual report and accounts. Um, members will note that the annual report and accounts of a number of departments, arms links, bodies and agencies were laid during assembly suspension. There is a list of the annual reports and accounts which are at page 315 of the pack. A link has been provided where members can access a full copy of any of the reports which are available online and any which are not available online can be provided through the committee office on request. So, Chair, if I can just say on that, we've gone through all of those and there were no qualifications placed by the Comptroller and Auditor General. So, effectively, the accounts that we've received thus far are, I want to use, a, I want to use the word clean in his view, but there have been no qualifications put on those accounts, so we're content that there are no major issues. Um, not all of the bodies are up to date yet, so what we'll do is we will uh, seek to find out what timetables are to bring accounts up to date. Um, if members leave that, as we bring that back as soon as we can. Okay. Okay. So then, moving on to item thirteen, which is our forward work program. Um, there is a draft forward work program on page three hundred and nineteen of the pack. Um, it was confirmed that the minister and permanent secretary will be brief the committee um, next Wednesday, the fifth, and um, also advise members that. Dr Malagy O'Neill, the Provost of Ulster University McGee, has kindly agreed to host the committee on Wednesday the 26th of February. Um, so I'd just like to ask members to agree the forward work programme to date and it will be updated on an ongoing phone basis. The members content, Chair. The other yes. thing I would flag up is there's a, a draft itinerary for the McGee visit in hard copy uh, in members' places if they want to take that away and have a look at it. Uh, we bring forward more detailed arrangements next week. Um, essentially, what we'd like to do is try and meet as many stakeholders as possible when we, when we go, which would involve trying to do a stakeholder dinner the night before and then a stakeholder breakfast in the morning, um, basically maximising engagement. So we will put in times and um, projected locations and so on for that, but there should be a hard copy on your, on your table somewhere there. If not, we'll get you one. I uh, just want to take that away and consider it for now. Thank you, Chair. Okay. So, are members content that the committee staff proceed with those arrangements? Yeah. Thank you. Um, moving on then to item 14, which is correspondence. Um, there is a number. There are a number of items of correspondence. Um, on page 322, there is correspondence from um, Paul Thru, MLA, regarding the current independent status of so Sony and impact on consumers. Um, members can be advised that the utility regulator has published a call for evidence on Sony governance in July 2019 and that concluded in October. The regulator expects to make a final policy decision as necessary towards the end of the first quarter of 2020. So um, if members are agreed, we would write to the department to request information of the timetable for publication of decisions following the call for evidence and that the committee be informed of the outcomes going forward. Great. Okay, then 14.2, there is correspondence from NI Farm Groups at page 323 requesting a meeting with the committee regarding the economic impact of farming and the need for legislation in relation to farm gate prices. Um, if members are agreed, there are a number of written re requests for meetings that have been received and these will be prioritised and scheduled within the forward work programme as appropriate. Um, so. We would, if members are agreed, to copy this correspondence to the Committee for Education for information and to inform NI Farm Group that this approach is an error. Yeah, it should yeah. have been an error. <laughs> Sorry. I think that might have been an autocorrect weird thing. Yeah, so to the, yeah, is it error committee? Okay. So then 14.3, um, there is um, a correspondence from NUSUSI on page 328. 
requesting a meeting with the chair to discuss the particular um, the review of the higher education strategy. So if members are content, um, the deputy chair and I will meet with NUSUSI and report back. Um, page or sorry, 14.4. Then um, there is correspondence from Hospitality Ulster, page 329, also requesting a meeting to discuss um, issues facing the industry. So again, if members are content, um, we will ask Hospitality Ulster to the stakeholder dinner um, when the committee visits Derry later this month. Oh, no, Nine not months. in no, February, not February next yet. month. Yeah, um, so then page. Or, sorry, 14.5, page 330, there is correspondence from the Chief Executive of Belfast Chamber um, providing a copy of the Chamber's manifesto and requesting an opportunity to brief the committee. Um, so that name's from in yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, So if members agree that a briefing from the Belfast Chamber will be incorporated into the forward work programme. Chair, if members are, what we'll try and do is, is also uh, bring in the, the wider... Chamber of Commerce family to that one, um, so the NI Chamber and um, potentially um, collecting a few others as well. We might have yeah. to turn it into something bigger yeah. than just a briefing, but we, we have some work on that to bring back to the committee. Okay. And um, 14.6 then, this correspondence, page 334 from the Head of Engagement at Queen's, providing a briefing note by Katie Hayward um, regarding the competence of the NI Assembly in the context of the UK withdrawal from the EU. Um, this paper has also been forwarded to other committees. Um, so just also to advise members, the examiner of statutory rules have confirmed that the Assembly's EU exit working group has over the last three years been actively engaged in consideration of the legal and practical issues arising from EU exit. Um, and that cross directorate team includes representatives from parliamentary services, raise um, the legal services office, and should the committee have any queries on any of these issues, appropriate briefings will be um, provided. Chair. the chair. Um, is there um, an opportunity that we perhaps could get Katie and maybe David Finn more in here to uh, talk to the committee in relation to um, the, the future arrangements and the um, potential challenges from the head? Chair, what we'll maybe look to do is again. Um, for maximum engagement, try and do that potentially as a discussion event. Um, we have a number of those in the pipeline. We've got a lot of um, briefings on EU exit coming up, and I think what we're seeking to do with those is provide factual perspective from the department, particularly in what exactly they're doing, also invest and also the impact on tourism and I. So we get that over the next few weeks. Once we've done that, members have a rounder picture of, of how the department's handling it. If we then arrange a discussion forum, we can bring in academics and various other stakeholders if members are content. I'm just conscious that it would be more useful for members potentially to hear from a broad background as well as the academics. If that's something members are um, contending, we try and get that done as quickly as possible. I think, um, well, from my perspective, moving forward, we need to really um, be very gelled up on what... Um, the situation is, and you know, maybe perhaps if we had um, the meeting with Katie first, well, that we actually knew then how to interrogate the information coming from the department. We try and make that work. I think in particular, these two academics, I think Katie sat on one of the government's advisory bodies yeah. yes. as well. Yeah. So yeah. I think these two academics actually are mm -hmm. specialists in this field. Yeah. Let, me, let me try and retrofit them into. <laughs> Work program. We will find a way. Mm -hmm. We will find a way. Don't worry. Um, leave that with us. Okay. Thank you. Um, where was I? Oh yeah. Pay, oh, sorry. Fourteen point seven. Correspondence from Workforce Training Services um, outlining concerns regarding the introduction of the new trainee um, ship trainee ship program at page three hundred and thirty eight. And they've requested a meeting with the chair, and we heard some of that from Heather today. Yeah. So we, we try and take that forward. So um, if members agree that the correspondence will also be forwarded to the department, yep. to yeah, sure. we we put that onto our Dallow readout so that we get um, a scheduled response to that. Um, page four, or sorry. Did you, sorry, did you want to I was just going to say, I'm sure um, other members have been approached by yeah. these organisations. This is a great concern for them um, for their viability going forward. 
So 14.8 then, um, there was correspondence considered at last week's meeting and um, already been mentioned by yes. Peter uh, from a member of the public regarding an alleged failure by local universities to undertake equality screening um, in the distribution of funding. A further additional correspondence has been received at page 342. Um, members agree, as agreed last week, permission will be requested um, from the author to forward it to the NA Audit Office, the Public Accounts Committee and the Permanent Secretary um, of the Department for Economy for a Chair, response. I've, I've already got that permission now, so we proceed right. to do that as per last okay. week. So Should we also advise him to send it on to the Equality Commission? He's already doing that. Okay. Um, I, I had a bit of a, a discussion with the Public Accounts Committee clerk as to what they're looking at. Like, she raised the same issue, but in his correspondence he had confirmed that um, okay. there's also an issue there. If it's not been sent, we'll add that. If members are content, we'll add that to yeah. um, the group. We'll just do that anyway. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, then 14.9, there's correspondence from the Chair of the Education Committee at page... 14, I assume, of the table pack, that is? Yes, mm -hmm. Requesting yeah. a joint committee session to hear from both of the departments in relation to the 14 to 19 yeah. strategy, um, which is going to be available in draft in March. So if members are content, we will um, pursue that joint committee session. Yes. 14.10, um, then, there's correspondence from Ofcom on page 16 of the table papers outlining new initiatives in relation to 3G and broadband and requesting a meeting with the committee. So, as discussed, then we will try and prioritise yeah. those into the forward work plan. Yeah. It fits in with some of what we've yeah. been hearing today as well, Chair. Um, 14.11 then, the investment strategy um, delivery report at page 17 of the table papers. This is yeah. an executive initiative designed to collate up-to-date information on the status of projects and their underlying investment activities. So um, it's to note unless there's any actions required. Yeah, if, if members take that away and look at it, it's quite a, a detailed, complicated table. And it's one you, you really do need to just sit down and have a good look at to kind of get your head around it. So if members want to take that away and if they want to flag anything that's concerning them or, or just any general comments up at next week's meeting, We'll, uh, we'll take those on board, Chair. Okay. Um, the other two are events. So, 1412, there is an invitation on page 22 of the table papers from Ulster and Queen's Universities of their Health, Equality and Economy paper, and the launch is at UU McGee's campus on Monday, the 24th of February. Yes, sir. And it's an afternoon, but mm. it's still a sitting day, so yeah. it might be complicated. So members can RSVP yeah. directly. Um, and also there was correspondence from IC2 um, requesting that the committee host an event to mark Workers Memorial Day in the Long Gallery on the 28th of April. Um, and we have... Yeah, Chair, if members are content, then uh, we've already got a provisional booking for the Long Gallery and essentially um, there will be a, a gathering and then I think just prior to that um, there's a wreath laid at a special memorial tree in the grounds of the estate. Mm -hmm. So, um, essentially, in sponsoring the event, uh, the committee secures the room. The um, IC2 will, will do all the organisation around that. But it's just one for members to put into their diary. We flag it up and put it into the forward work programme just so members are aware again. Okay, so item 15 then is any other business? No. Nope. Nope. Um, then item 16 is the January monitoring round, which we, we had at the beginning of the week. Um, the minister's statement is on page 23 of the table papers. The in-year monitoring as is at page 38 of the table papers and EU exit preparation allocations are page 42 of the table papers. All departments have been advised by the finance minister to engage with their committee prior to the budget bill being brought back to the assembly in February. And the finance minister is due to brief the committee today on that process. I assume the finance committee. Sorry, yes, not us. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. um, Sorry. So the Finance Minister's monitoring round statement highlighted that the Department received £300 million in resource Dell to honour commitment to the FE colleges that they would access year-end underspends to allow them to better manage their, um, the impact of the difference between the financial and academic years. The Department also received £1 million in capital Dell for minor works on FE colleges. Um, the table accompanying the statement is page three, or sorry, 32 on the table papers. Members will note that 63.5 million reduced requirement regarding HD loans 
Um, members may also wish to note that the department's <coughs> admins costs will fall by 2.2 per cent in this financial sure, that's year. A, a, as, as those who have been ministers will know, there's a, a, an annual requirement to uh, put downward pressure on administrative costs in um, departments, and the, the department has, has managed to uh, do that for the, the financial year that we're in. And Chair, also, I know members were, were flagging up the 63 and a half uh -huh. million um, in uh, unused um, higher education loans. I think it's worth um, putting that into the data readout as well, just to fully understand how that works. I know we, we heard a bit about that today, but mm. I think it would be useful just to understand the process in writing yeah. as to how that works. Who pays for what, how much, and so on. Yeah. So we we get that um, on our schedule of, of written briefing. It seems, seems very very high. It's, it's, it, it seems unusually. High. Yeah. So then yeah. moving on to page forty two, the table papers, the EU exit pre preparations allocation um, highlighted the invest and I was allocated two million. Yeah. Um, if members agree to write to the minister requesting a, a written briefing on the department's baseline budget and the pressures and easements that the department is facing going forward. Great. Through, through the chair, just can I ask what the, the, the Invest NI money was for? We didn't get a detailed breakdown, so what we'll do is we'll also put that on our DALA readouts. So we'll get a written briefing on what that is. Um, the unfortunate thing about the money, it's great to get the monitoring papers now. Um, but sometimes you just don't get a breakdown. So what we get is the headlines because yeah. it's issued by the Department of Finance. Yeah. So what we will do is we will ask for yeah. our own um, economy yeah. paper on that. So it gives us more detail on the yeah. bids, what they got, what they yeah. didn't get. Yeah. So we, we put that again on the data. It wouldn't down. really be for the finance minister to tell us. No, no and that's, that's why the documents yeah, the are less yeah. fulsome. I suppose the, the other thing... It would be nice to have that information in advance before the monitoring or just, just exactly what the bits are. This was a very odd yeah. one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What we would normally do now that we're, I'm assuming we, we seem to have got back to the, the three monitoring rounds in a year. What we would usually do is we'd get a briefing in advance. Yeah. And I'm, I'm looking at officials and, and I'm, I'm promising that that's going to be the case. And I'm getting response from officials that says yes. <laughs> what it'll also allow us to do in writing to the minister around the baseline budget is again for the budget coming next month. The committee will be in a much better position to understand what's going on with that. Yeah. The process will change. It's it's not, well, I'm, I'm saying this, it's not going to be as labyrinthine as it was before. I'm saying that, but I could easily be proved wrong. It may need to be. But my understanding is it's going to be a little bit clearer. But that will just give members an understanding of where the budget needs to go, where the pressures are. First day brief and the other documents from the department indicate fairly massive pressures. And it will just be a case of seeing how those are going to be managed and what the department's expectations are. Um, I'm sure probably members will also want to flag up some of those with the minister when she's here next week. But we'll uh, write to the minister to ask for a full written layout on that. Yeah, and that was just and the And that will be published thing. correspondence, to, sorry, Chair, as well. To um, which, um, we are due to hear from the minister and permanent yeah. secretary next week, so the committee will have the opportunity yeah. then to discuss those issues. Um, and... Sorry, just in relation to the things that we may want to raise with the, the department, do we, you have a list? Yep, we have a list on that and we circulate. Okay. Um, then item 17 is the next meeting, which is um, next Wednesday at 10 a.m. in room 29. The very same place. Good job. Thank you, so, Chair. The meeting be adjourned. Assembly, committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.